Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Facts on the Ground. My name is Misty Winston, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jesse Zerowell. Um, today, we have two very special guests. Um, we first have Bruce Thompson, who um, is a friend of mine on Twitter. Um, and then we also have somebody who I don't really think probably needs an introduction. Um, he's been yeah. kind of the talk of Twitter <laughs> for a while now, uh, but we have Magnus Panvidia on the show, um, who was recently on the Jimmy Dore show um, uh, after giving a fantastic speech at the Michigan Capitol um, during a protest. And we are very excited to um, talk to him and dig in a little bit deeper into um, some of the things that have been going on surrounding all the controversy. So thank you both very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's the, the need, need no introduction is super weird. <laughs> so, well, I mean, that. let's be honest. <laughs> let's be honest. You have been um, a polarizing force as of late. Um, and when I first storms. spoke to you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I first spoke to you on Twitter, when we DM'd, you were like, you know, I'm just some random dude who decided to give a speech and I'm just trying to make the best of it now. And that's really all you can do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, before we dive into any of the controversy or any of that stuff, um, Jesse and I were both talking earlier and we're just kind of interested like um, about more of like your background. I know you said you used to be an environmental activist and things like that. So can you just kind of tell us about like who you are? Because I think some of um, you is getting lost in a lot of the controversy. So can you just kind of give us like a brief backstory? Uh, yeah, uh, I was just raised in a middle of nowhere, like population 300 northern Michigan town, like hippie activist kid my whole life. The, you know, the type of guy saved the trees going around picking up garbage for fun. Just typical, you know, the one weird kid that wore drug rugs and listened to Sublime in the school kind of kid. And then when I, I graduated, I just kind of was an environmental activist for many years. I was really active in Detroit, particularly around the turn on the water marches, which was the whole controversy of them going around and shutting off people in Detroit's water because their bills were late, but then allowing like these corporations to never pay their water bills and whole fiasco around that. So I, I did that for a really long time. And then kind of once Obama got elected, I, I, you know, I used to be very, very far like radical left, like borderline tanky communist radical left and uh the moment obama got elected all of my activist friends stopped caring about everything i'd kind of come up to him and be like hey we're bombing syria isn't this awful and they'd be like yeah and it's like well like when george bush was you know president we were we were out causing all sorts of hell and we're you know where were all of you so then i kind of slowly but surely went from the top left all the way down to the bottom and slowly over the years and a lot of reading and stuff just kind of became an anarchist and that's, you know, brought me to where I am now with, with the boog and everything that's going on. Uh, so, uh, Magnus, before we get into more of that, uh, more of what's been happening lately, uh, Bruce, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, my first presidential vote was for John Anderson when he ran against uh, Reagan and Carter in 1980. So I've been all over the place. I supported Jerry Brown. uh early on, Paul Soundus, and when the Clintons came along with the DLC and started marginalizing the left, I just lost faith totally. So uh, I basically, during the Obama years, I voted for Ron Paul twice. I've been an independent for a very long time. Uh, was borderline libertarian, uh, but um, basically Bernie Sanders came along, and when it looked like that guy could pass a lie detector test, I said, I got to pay some freaking attention to him. So uh, yeah, that was sort of brought me over to where I am, well, not really, sort of pushed me to the left, but now uh, I find myself more and more wanting to try and reach out to people who, you know, may not be in line with us straight along, but uh, where we can make some common cause on some things. Absolutely. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Magnus, um, you gave us a little bit of your background, your biography, and you detailed it quite a bit on Jimmy Dore's show, so I don't want to rehash what's been done. So if we can get to the Boogaloo Boys and, well, perhaps before that, when you started really getting politically involved and then how that transferred into your involvement, your affiliation, whatever you want to call it, with the Boogaloo Boys and and why you felt it was necessary for you, just you're speaking for yourself, to uh, to make comrades with 
such a group? Yeah, so uh, pretty much like always, even even kind of when I was a bit of a leftist, I always really liked the ideas of militia and everything like that, of like organizing the community and like if anything goes bad, we're the people with the guns that are going to protect people. But I always had issue finding groups because traditionally militias are like old, you know, old white dudes smoking cigars, hanging out with a bunch of Confederate flags and like very, very conservative and boomerish and you don't really fit in that, you know, as like young people. So I kind of never, I was looking for something. And then, you know, months before even, you know, the coronavirus or anything, this kind of like libertarian, this you know, libertarian anarchist kind of idea was coming along with militias of like, hey, we're sick of these guys. They're, they're all fake. They're just a bunch of old dudes. They're never going to do anything. They just sit around and complain about liberals. And it's not, they're not going to step up. So like, let's start organizing as like young people. Like, let's be the next generation. And that sort of was the foundation and how they started bubbling. And then when the lockdown, like the, the lockdowns, uh, Duncan Lemp and Brianna Taylor, all three of those events happening so close to each other, kind of like catalyzed everything and brought all of us together. And in, in the beginning, it was much more free formed and like the ideas weren't as hammered out. So you did have more traditional conservative people kind of like hanging out and stuff. But as more and more we were showing up to like, events that the right wing would be very upset that we were at and why we were at those events. All of those people left. And by the time we were hitting summer and everything, the, the idea of the Boogaloo movement, as I talk about it, had, had finally started solidifying as like this exclusively libertarian anarchist thing. And all the other people had bled off and started calling us communists and dirty anarchists and everything, even though that's like the reason why that movement started coming together, if, if we wanted to be three percenters or Oath Keepers or something, we would just go join those organizations. We wanted something different. So that's kind of how all, the, all that like came into being. I think that's OK. So I think that's a good like jumping off point to talk about the Boogaloo Boys, because I think something that is getting um, maybe, I don't know, misinterpreted, probably intentionally, is that this isn't even um a centralized movement correct this is not like you don't have like a national organizational structure there's no hierarchy um you know it's it's mostly just independent groups throughout the country um kind of adhering to the same sort of ideals is that accurate yeah, to say yeah ab absolutely like like the the individual it's mostly by state but even like in some states there's multiple kind of different you know for lack of a better word factions even though everyone's kind of cool with each other but we all agree on these basic unifying principles and there there has been attempts to make national organizations but we're a bunch of anarchists so it doesn't <laughs> really it doesn't really work out well and you know a lot of people scream at each other and then go their own way but uh it, it's very decentralized you know nobody represents anybody i only speak for myself and the people that have given me direct permission to speak for them and if anyone you know thinks that i disagree with if anyone disagrees with me they will let me know immediately and that was kind of the thing with Antifa in the beginning. Like if you, if you go back to like May and June, the like talking to people about the idea of marching with Antifa would have been like, no. And they would call you crazy and they didn't want that. But there was people in the movement like me and, and other people that started meeting people from Antifa and these events and kind of changing our mind and being like, hey, do we have this kind of like whether we were aware or not, like conservative bias against this group? Have we been lied to? And we talked to them more and more and we, you know, things organically change throughout the entire movement to get to where it is now. So it's very decentralized. It's very internet culture in that way. Cause I think how like a lot of people that don't understand internet culture, like struggle to try to put us in a box desperately when that's just not how things work. Right. And I actually think that that leads me to another point that we really wanted to make sure that we uh, included here is that people seem to be attributing, um, uh, political positions or ideas to you that you have never yourself said that you hold. Um, yeah. You know, people are, are claiming that you're a Nazi or that you're a white supremacist or that you're racist or that you're homophobic or whatever. I've seen it all over Twitter. Um, you know, is people are attacking you. <laughs> right? That's surreal. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, you have a you have a really homophobic flag in the background. Yeah, so. I know. It's <laughs> an extraordinarily homophobic flag, and you know, like the, yeah. the way. The way I talk and, and, you know, like my habitual flirting with men on Twitter, definitely very homophobic <laughs> behavior. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, to me, that is it's it's a very strange 
um, phenomenon that, you know, just because you associate with this group that has, for whatever reason, been given this moniker of being a white supremacist group, you are now being labeled as such, despite the fact that you very clearly, um, you know, put forth your own ideas, which are nothing to do with white supremacy or um, Nazism or any of those things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is that... There's- there's been like there's and it was really weird because the first week of me like going public on door and like everyone going to my Twitter, I went through so many weird purity tests of just like these left wing people coming out of nowhere and being like, what's your opinion on this? What's your opinion on abortion? What's your opinion on environmentalism? What is your opinion on whiteness? And I'm like, like, yeah, I have opinions on all of those. But I, I, I know you're asking me because you want to get an answer from me. And then if you're not happy with that, you will go and say the entire boog stands for this. And I'm like, yeah. I'm aware of what you're doing. Like, you're not asking for my personal opinion. You're looking you're looking for something to demonize every single person who flies the same flag as me. And that's super devious and shifty and it's gross. <laughs> it's just gross. Behavior. Yes, I agree. I mean, there I mean. There are okay. So I before, pre, prior to your speech and being on Jimmy Dore, I had heard of the Boogaloo Boys, but I had never really paid that much attention to who they were, what they stood for, what they did. Um, you know, I just kind of like had heard the name and was like, okay, whatever. Um, but since you went on Jimmy Dore, I really like tried to do um, you know some research, which is difficult because it isn't really an organization. Um, it, it is decentralized. There wasn't any one specific like galvanizing point in which birthed the movement. Um, like Black Lives Matter. It was was a very clear, distinct point in time. It was like Trayvon Martin was murdered, Black oh, wow. Lives Matter was born. It's much more difficult to do, you know, a, a research into a, a, the Boogaloo Boy movement. Um, but I've done I my best. Could, I definitely could say that that the moment would be the Duncan Lemp murder. Like the right. moment, the mo- the moment that happened, everybody was like that. We we officially formed because a lot of these three percenter organizations and everything wouldn't even show up to its protest. They didn't care. The conservatives, were, you know, conservative people are all like, oh, why don't you protest and riot when a white dude's shot by a cop? And it's like, we tried and you guys didn't show up. Mm-hmm. Right. You didn't show up. You were, the, the, the only people there were libertarians and anarchists. No conservative showed up. So that was the kind of the moment where we're like, we need to go our own way. Like, these, this is dead weight. They, they don't actually believe what they believe. And if we're going to do this, we need to be our own thing. So. Right. But I, th- I think that's um, really hard to find on the internet because the, re- the under-reporting on the Duncan Lemp situation is so crazy. The media does not want to talk about that at all because it's this weird confluence of gun confiscation and police murder and a bunch of taboo subjects that the media doesn't want to touch. Well, and the mainstream media is pretty useless anyways. Um, well, that's but, something yeah. we can get into a little, a little bit later, hopefully. Yeah. But- Bruce, I see you raising your hand. Is there is there something you'd like to add? And uh, yeah, um, if, there, if there is, please go ahead yes, and I'd I'd just also, speak up because we'll I'd talk. Also, <laughs> I'd, also, I'd also like to um, get both of your respective just barge not, right in, right? I just uh, no, right along with, okay, go ahead, Bruce. Uh, right along with Magnus, I don't uh, you know I don't speak for anybody. Obviously, I'm speaking for myself. And um, I want to ask you, Magnus, because you linked out an article on Twitter a little earlier. It wasn't an article, really. It was a story written by a woman in Tampa who was looking at the BLM protest going on in Tampa and decided, hey, I'm going to Louisville and started reporting on what was going on there. I think she put this up in September, but she was over there in the summertime. And the groups that she was talking about, uh, she didn't mention Boogaloo specifically, but she mentioned uh, United Pharaoh Guard as one. And I think uh, uh, Not Fucking Around Coalition was the other one. And I'm just wondering... You guys loosely affiliated with them at all? I mean, yeah. uh, their their positions seem to be right down the line. You know what you're about, except for maybe they don't get involved in any foreign policy stuff. I don't yeah, think. Uh, you you a lot of members of UPG I speak to every single day. John, one of the main guys in UPG, is in every one of my chats, and we actually all did a kind of joint kind of I operation i guess that sounds too cool but like we all we all got together to go to columbus to join the families of community members that were killed by police and speak out and we were all there with them so they're like upg as a whole is not really like a boogaloo organization but there are many boogaloo boys inside of it so that just like you know that i i share that story out because you you, you saw in that article of pictures of like we were on the streets in Louisville, members of our organization, every single day throughout the entire summer, nobody talked about it. John yeah. is in John is in the tra- trailer of the ABC Breonna Taylor documentary, okay. marching with protesters. Nobody talked about it. 
And like there was, it, it definitely seemed like the whole like uh, layers of denial were like the media at first just desperately tried to deny our existence. And then the moment where we started becoming too widespread and we were getting too far in with these organizations and too public, that's when the demonization campaign happened. And that also happened right around the time that we was we were banned off of everything. So it's well, been a real it's been a real struggle until lately of like to prove a lot of my claims because a lot of it was on Facebook and it's all been deleted. But slowly but surely, I'm I'm reconnecting with these people and being like, oh, hey, this picture that I was talking about, here's that picture. Oh, that live stream when I said we were at this event, here's that live stream. And it's all people smart enough to save it to their phone. I'm like, I you know I didn't save a lot of stuff because I didn't assume that I would be deleted off the entire internet. Huh. You, well, know? What, you know what was one of the things that was riveting about that writing was that she was from Tampa and had been. Uh, at these Tampa BLM protests and watch police basically grab people and mace them or whatever the hell they were doing. And then when she's in um, Louisville near Breonna Taylor Square, she sees an African-American running across towards the square being chased by police. And he gets close, the police get close. But as he gets to the square where, you know, UPG and uh, NFAC are standing there armed, the police stop. And that That's whole notion that, you know, they don't want to get into a shootout. You know, they want to have the advantage situation and only press that advantage when they have it. So it's like, okay, if these groups are here, it's not just a, not just a reaction to the police. It's, it's protecting the First Amendment for those people. Absolutely, because the, the police are infinitely more hesitant to go after an armed group for any reason. But if they just see some college kids standing around holding signs, they'll beat them to a pulp with, with no hesitation. So mm -hmm. that was kind of like the, the two reasons we would ever show up to an event as open boogaloos, because like all of these people, including like if we had people at the courthouse in Portland, they weren't wearing Hawaiian because it wasn't necessary in that situation. But if we show up with our plate carriers and with our rifles and everything, it's either because there's been consistent outside groups, whether that be Proud Boys, whether it be militia, whether it be, you know, random antagonists that have consistently come and harass protesters, or it's because we saw that the police were running people over with horse cops and tear gassing people and shooting people with rubber bullets. And then, you know, particularly in Houston, when we showed up, people stood in between the cops that were tear gassing everybody and the protesters in gas masks and plate carriers with their rifles and stood there and the cops just stopped. And because they don't, you know, they want, they want to go home. There's, there's no threat to their life to, you know, just shoot some kid holding a boom box with a rubber bullet in the face. But if, if yeah. you shoot somebody that's got a rifle, they start to, you know, kind of think about it. So that that's definitely part of our, our line of logic of like the second ensuring the first is like, Hey, you know, these are people and they have a right to be here and you cannot do this. And if you're going to continue to use such excessive force on them, then there's going to be a reaction, whether that be and it like pure, you know, pure black groups like NFAC, whether they be mixed groups like us or whether they even be, you know, Trump supporters and everything. Like if, if the more force you put on a group of people, especially in America, the more you're going to see armed individuals ensuring that those people can protest. Absolutely. I 100 percent agree with that. And I would like to talk more about that in a little bit, but just to back up to give some clarity <clears throat> to what's been discussed so far, uh, both you, Magnus, and Bruce have uh, mentioned libertarianism and anarchism, and people ac have, across the spectrum, have their definitions of, of what each of those means, um, you know, let alone what a libertarian anarchist means. Um, and I'm, I'm not even sure there is a concrete definition for either, but I'm, I'm wondering what it means to both of you and um, how that informs where you're coming from with uh, your political work. Yeah, if, you, if you want to go first, Bruce. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So like me personally, like uh, I, polit I'd say politically I'm a libertarian, but I mean that specifically in just the party that I vote for when I take when I participate in election politics. I vote for the libertarian party but my, my personal politics is i am an anarchist i consider myself a volunteerist which just means that i i believe you can do pretty much any consenting adults can do whatever they want as long as everyone in the group agrees to it and can pull their consent out at any point so that applies both directions if someone wants an anarcho-capitalist village where every as long as everyone consents to it that's fine but at the same time if, if 100 people want to get together and say hey we're going to go be communists over here as long as everyone agrees, that's great, too. So that's kind of like the whole idea of volunteerism is just, you know, everything, everything is based upon consent and, you, and your ability to withdraw your consent at any time. So that's my lot, version of anarchism. 
I think a lot of people who are libertarians or claim to be or are voting for libertarian party people, uh, they don't understand that the roots of libertarian is anarchism. I mean, it basically is derived from anarchism because of the lack of the centralized government. And, you know, there is a libertarian socialism, which basically is, again, decentralized, where it's a lot of local control over things. And I think that one of the things that Magnus uh, puts out on his Twitter account is that, by the way, it was really a stupid idea for Facebook, uh, Facebook to deplatform you and send you over here because this is where all the leftists are. So you found a really quick home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would have been better off leaving you on Facebook. But uh, just like with the Reddit people, <laughs> when they right. came over here and got all these people. But uh, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, libertarianism as a party but in, and in practice are really like two different things. But I think the commonality is with socialism and, you know, what I'm, I'm probably veering toward where misty is which is more like anarcho-communism which is basically we don't need the state we can work around it and take care of each other absolutely mm. and I'm, I'm exactly in the middle of i find both of those are, are perfectly valid and acceptable and i don't see any re I, like i hate that i hate the anarcho-capitalist anarcho-communist wars that i feel like they don't exist because if, if if you're an actual anarchist then you don't care what anyone else does as long as nobody's telling you what to do and nobody's rights are being stomped on so like, why yeah. are you why are you fighting? You you in reality, you should perfectly ex be able to coexist. Yeah, I think where, people like, people can't understand things unless you label it. I mean, labels are yeah. for soup cans, as far as I'm concerned. You know, yeah, people, that's people... and frankly, the <laughs> fact that we're having a conversation about um, capitalism versus communism when we haven't even dealt with the oppressive government is baffling to me. Like yeah. we there that isn't an, even a conversation we can have yet. Like we can't we can't have any conversation about what it comes next until we deal with what we're in now. And, um, you know, we, ha we have to be able to deal with um, the system in which we find ourselves now. Yeah. And that's, you know, been really part of the reason why I've been so interested in this controversy is that it seems like um, there's a concerted effort to keep people from talking amongst themselves, even when they have disagreements. And um, something I've seen on Twitter is that there are people who haven't even watched, they will admit they haven't even watched the Jimmy Dore interview, um, who are calling you a Nazi and a fascist. And it's, it's, it's this it's really bad. weird. Um, these are grown ass adults. Um, yeah. and, and, and I, I, I always use the analogy. It's, it's like, it's like we're in like an underwater, like glass tank and someone just poked a hole in it and you got two people in there and it's like, Hey, you know, I, I would be the third person like, Hey, we should plug that hole. And then the two no. people are like, we're not plugging that hole until you agree with me that Medicare for all is good, is the best. And then the other person <laughs> would be like, well, we're not, we're not plugging that, that hole until we reduce taxes. And they argue and argue until the whole fish tank is filled up and, and they're drowning, strangling each other while arguing. It's like, I, that's why, you know, I even put it that stat, that tweet out of like, I'm not interested in arguing over moral and economic theory. I am here saying that everything is going to hell. People are dying. There's wars everywhere. People are locked in prison that don't belong there. If you can't, put aside your differences and march together to fight this now under this system, then I have no reason to believe that you're going to be willing to do that under your preferred utopia. If you won't stand now, then you're not going to stand under socialism. If you won't stand now, then you're not going to stand under anarchy. You're just, you, you don't want to solve the problem until you get your way, which is a really weird kind of like position of privilege. That's, yes. a, great, that's, a, that's a great yeah, way to put it. You see it happening out there right now on Twitter with people that were like, you know, comrades in arms it's like all of a sudden wait you want to talk to him it's like yeah <laughs> yeah yes and here's why here's why i want to talk to magnus um i have seen videos of the boogaloo boys putting their bodies on the line for my comrades and I'm okay with that. I, we that, have we that... have casualties too. We have people that have been maimed. Garrett Foster, the big example. Garrett Foster literally fucking died protecting BLM protesters. Shot and killed protecting BLM protesters. That that the igloo that's half and cap half, you know, communist that's on my banner on Twitter. That was the last thing he shared out before he died. So his literal dying wish was us for to stop fighting each other and come together. So the fact that like year you know months later he's slandered as a white supremacist even though he was married to a to a you know quadriplegic black woman and he was at BLM protesters providing security but now he's a white nationalist it's like yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking kidding me I mean <laughs> it Orwellian is is too cliche and it's beyond Orwellian at this point and just before we go into a bunch of what's happened with regard to the media narrative and the censorship and the way that these terms neo-nazi white supremacist fascist have been bandied about especially of late 
after the uh, what happened at the Capitol. I'm not going to call it a coup. I'm not going to call it a storming because I don't think it was either of those. I call it a clown fiesta. I think that's the best. <laughs> it's just a clown fiesta. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's I, an account we all know on, on Twitter, Steve Cox, uh, one of his things he tweeted out was that, you know, one of the problems is people, we need to be at the Capitol, but not with dumb people. Yes. yes. Right. And by the way, I love Steve Cox. Everybody should follow Steve Cox on Twitter. He's hilarious. I love uh, him. Yeah. But he's part of the solution for sure. Yes. So we before we get into um, more of that, I wanted to ask about, because there's a lot of I'm going to say uninformed speculation and uh, smearing regarding the name Boogaloo Boys and its origin. So I'm wondering if uh, you can speak to that, Magnus. Yeah, so so literally, like, what happened with Pepe and that whole scenario is exactly what's going on now. Like, like the Boogaloo meme has been a meme that has been around forever on the internet. All it means is is a shitty sequel or or derivative version of something that's already come before and then it picked up wind in gun cultures and stuff years ago and has been used by literally everybody in the gun community whether it be you know radical religious indian revolutionaries all the way to like socialists you know ukrainians and everyone in between it just means like an armed conflict or a collapse like it's very similar to like zombie apocalypse memes but they're doing this thing to where they're like, oh, Nazis used it sometimes, so thus it belongs to the Nazis. Ignoring the fact that, like, that meme has existed for so long, it's been used by all sorts of people all across the internet for various different reasons. But just because they, you know, arbitrarily decided, like, oh, no, you know, we noticed that neo-Nazis really, like, share a lot of Boogaloo memes. And it's like, it's just, it, to me, like, if, if you substitute Boogaloo for zombie apocalypse meme, it makes perfect sense of how dumb this is. It's like, oh, zombie movies are, are white supremacists because they, sh- they wa- talk about zombies all the time. <laughs> it's like, no, it's, not, it's not how this works, you know? It's, 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 it's very ironic that a bunch of socialists are very, like, obsessed over the idea of intellectual property when it comes to memes. As <laughs> if anyone can, anyone can own a meme. Any, you know, a meme belongs to anyone. And it doesn't constantly right. shift and change and be appropriated by different groups to mean different things. That's why it's called a meme. Yeah, like, <laughs> exactly. Well, like, like, if like, like if these people just stopped and thought about it for like a single moment, they'd be like, "Wait, like." And if they if they tried to apply it to anything else, like, "Oh, is SpongeBob a, a fascist dog whistle?" Because you know, there's a lot of people sp- posting SpongeBob memes on poll on 4chan. It's like, no, that's ridiculous. I use SpongeBob <laughs> memes all the time. They're right, funny. Uh, What's wrong yeah. with SpongeBob? Yeah, if you try to apply it to literally anything else, you realize how it's dumb. But I, I think they're they're will they willfully know that it's ridiculous. They willfully know that like, like uh, the the one claim against us all the time is like, oh, we show up to these protests to cause accelerationism to try to start a race war, and I'm like. So why are we protecting protesters? If we're trying to infiltrate these protests, why are we wearing bright Hawaiian shirts and open carrying firearms? If we wanted like chaos and like assassinations and bloodshed, why would we be walking out in the open? Why wouldn't it be like a network of snipers or people secretly putting bombs or something? So like if you just yeah. like stop and think of like what they thought, what they say we're trying to do, if that's something we actually wanted to do, we picked the most inefficient and stupid way to go about it humanly possible. It would, resemble more of, it would resemble more of the massacre that occurred uh, in Maidan in, yeah. in 2014. Yeah. That's it, a perfect it, example. That's a perfect example. I, I, I followed the Ukrainian revolution through the whole thing. Like, you're exactly right. Like, that, the, the sniper incident in Maidan would be what they think we are, but we're walking mm-hmm. out in public. It, the most identifiable patterns and colors and behavior possible. Well, not so, only that. It's well, and that's... that's, people, that's a, people, oh, go ahead, Bruce. I'm sorry. Well, and the people that put the term accelerationist on you, I mean, okay, I mean, what do you want to accelerate? I mean, I want to accelerate, uh, you know, wealth taxes, and I want to accelerate, you know, bringing down the banks and, you know, getting people the money back, paying off people's mortgages. I mean, being an accelerationist is not a bad thing. It's just, you know, they're going to apply I that I get term. called an accelerationist all the time, and that's bullshit. I'm not accelerating anything. The people it's, in charge are accelerating things. Exactly, We're just exactly. reacting to... I mean, that's that's real talk. That the, exactly. I'm not I'm not accelerating anything. I think that we need to react quicker to what's happening to us. That's like that's it. The two, um, the two, but I, the two I did points, want to touch on something. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. The the two points I always use against that is like is like for one, the same people that are like, oh, you know, 
conflict and collapse and, and a civil war will never come to America. You're so crazy. You're a bunch of radical accelerationists. But then they'll turn around and be like, you literally can't speak to the other side. They're wrong and we need to destroy them. It's like, okay, who wants the civil war here? Because I'm talking yeah. to everybody and you have that. And then the other thing is uh, not to stan AOC at all. I'm re- not a fan of her at all. But the same people that, that are yelling at AOC for being an incrementalist are yelling at me for being an accelerationist. Mm-hmm. It's like... What the fuck? <laughs> like, Excel- Excel- <laughs> Accelerationist is a dumber way of saying, of smearing somebody as an extremist. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. essentially what yeah. it boils down to. It makes to. them sound smarter, but they don't actually, you know, it's a stupid yeah. take. It's, just, you know, it's, it's an extension of identity politics. They want to help people out by labeling people, and all of a sudden we know what that label means. We can't talk to them. Yeah, we've, we've painted the target. Now you can everybody go after that person. Yeah. Yeah, and it and it, and it always com- it always comes back to language, which is again something we'd like to hit on in a little bit with regard to the the media narrative and also the censorship on social media. Um, but it reminds me of uh, the surge in the so-called troop surge in two thousand seven when Bush Jr. was still uh, in power, and it wasn't a surge anymore; it was a plus up. They had to <laughs> brand it as a plus up, so it was more palatable for the public to accept. The Patriot Act, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is an acronym. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were you were gonna you were about to say something though, Missy. Yeah, were, I just about- wanted I thank you because I was gonna forget, but I um I just wanted to touch on a lot of people are saying that um you're faking your positions, you're not really anti-war and anti-police and all of that stuff, that you're trying to infiltrate the leftist movement. And something I find interesting about that is I could believe that. Listen, I have been a leftist my entire life. And that is something that the left has to deal with. We have to deal with the potential um, of people trying to infiltrate our movements and co-opt and corrupt them. That happens all the time. That's not, you know, that's something that we do have to be worried about. But if you are faking it and if the Boogaloo boys are faking it, it seems like a weird thing to go out and get your ass beat by Proud Boys um, to fake it. Uh, Jesse and I were talking about this earlier. I, if I were faking, I'm not going to go out and start a fight with somebody to, to prove my point. Um, so what do you say to people who think that you're lying and that you're not genuinely anti-war and anti-cops and anti-establishment and all of those things? Because that's one of the biggest things I've seen on Twitter is that you're not really this person and that you're faking it. And that's why that's why like I posted that whole thing of people like, oh, you were you didn't used to be a Marxist when you were a kid. And I posted that picture of me 19 years old with that sign with my, you know, planet Earth flag and everything at an environmental protest. I got pictures of me at, you know, the million mask march in Detroit for years and years and years. So like that's that that's that end of it is like, yes, I am everything I say I am. And on the other side of like, if we wanted to infiltrate leftism, then all I would have to say, all I would have to do is agree with leftists on every single point they agree with. And just blend in to where I've made it very vocal on my Twitter and very vocal in my interviews that I am an anarchist. I am to the right of most of these people on a lot of issues. And if I wanted to blend in, then I wouldn't be rabble rousing and making so many disagreements and arguments on particular things I do disagree with. I would just in lockstep on every single position. So like if I have the whole idea of infiltrating leftist circles, like we're we're trying to be this weird thing that doesn't exist anymore of like a parallel or an ally, like an actual ally, not some subservient or someone who is perfectly in line with you and everything. I, I, we have any alliance together. We will work together despite our differences, not being perfectly uniform with each other. And just from experience, I can tell you, you know, going out on Magnus's uh, uh, Twitter page, I mean, the people that I've encountered out there and, you know, tried to make a case, where we disagree. We disagree about abortion. We disagree about uh, immigration. But, you know, I found those people to be a lot more receptive than the people on the left who, when you mentioned, you know, Magnus and the Boogaloo movement, you're right away, oh, well, you wouldn't be uh, defending them unless you were also all right. And it's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a lot of shit. I got a lot of shit just for going on Alex Jones, even though like a third of my interview with Alex Jones was defending Antifa mm-hmm. explicitly to Alex yeah. Jones. And like, yeah. where where of all where are all of you? Are you willing to go on to Alex Jones and defend leftist positions? Or are you too much of a coward? You think he? Do you think you're going to get beat by Alex Jones? Me, the random idiot. Right. I I can confront him, but you can't. Like, what the yeah. fuck? <laughs> like, 
Yeah, I get called um, a secret alt writer too all the time. Um, it's really ridiculous. I feel like that is something that um, I like to call them the hipster left likes to toss about because, um, you know, these are these are not serious people. They sit behind a keyboard. They're not in the streets. They're not willing to do the work. They um, like to make everything about a personality instead of about positions and policy and, um, you know, it's um, been endlessly frustrating to me. I'm sure you're, I mean, now you're dealing, I'm, maybe you've been dealing with it all along, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 this weird thing where, you know, me thinking that we should have conversations with people we disagree with somehow makes me a Nazi collaborator. That's absurd. Um, you know, I live in small town Ohio. I'm surrounded by Trump voters. I say this all the time. You know, like I, the people all around, like the guy at my favorite gas station is a Trump voter and we talk about college college football and my mother-in-law is a Trump voter and my friend or my kids friends uh, parents are Trump voters and they're not bad people like these are just hardworking people who've been screwed over by their government and they've been propagandized to be mad at the wrong things and the wrong people but I think it's the height of privilege the height of privilege for a white person to say I refuse to speak to other white people who disagree with me um that is something we should be doing that i mean you can't change anybody's mind or make anything better if you don't even have conversations right um, be, be daryl davis daryl like like all these and it's funny because daryl davis gets so much shit from people when literally he has like the most leftist clout of any individual in the world the dude took a hundred clan robes with words and dinner like you have yes. like you know, no violence, no state oppression, like and people hate him and people show up to his events and call him a traitor and everything. So like you see that with people and he's way more effective at doing what they try to do than they, you know, they are. And even well, one of my heroes right now is um, I don't know if you know who she is. Jimmy Bohr actually mentioned her on his show recently. Uh, Reverend Annie Chambers. Um, she's a former Black Panther. She is a badass. She is still an activist. She still marches. She feeds her neighborhood every day, every single day from her house. Um, she is an amazing woman. And um, she has uh, my friend Steve has a show called Slow News Day, and he has had her on many times. And she tells the story about when she joined forces with the KKK on the Vegas Strip to shut it down. And um, there were leftists literally calling her trash um, <laughs> on Twitter. She's a former Black Panther who has been, she's like 83, I think, or something. Um, she has been in the streets since she was like 15 years old, um, you know, working and in, 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 in being an activist. And so the <laughs> if you're calling Reverend Annie Chambers trash because she is willing to do what you're not willing to do you have problems like that that's not that's not a rational thing to say this is somebody who has been doing this for a long time and has had success with it they were successful they got what they wanted out of that and but people don't want to hear that it doesn't work with their narrative it doesn't work with them being able to demonize everybody that they don't agree with and i'm not saying that like the clan is good and we should be working with the clan fuck no they're assholes they you know but at the same time if if reverend annie chambers can there's a picture of her hand in hand with the grand wizard <laughs> you know right. what i'm saying that's like, how you change that's, minds that's, that's how you win hearts you like yes. be, be nice to people and you will change their mind if you be a cunt to people they're never going to change their mind like i i, I shared that uh i went on a trump supporters uh podcast and i talked to him for a while about blm and antifa and i went through his comments and there was several comments of people being like you know, I'm, I'm still conservative and I'm very right leaning, but I'm starting to question if the whole narrative about BLM has been fed to me by the media and I bought into this us versus them thing. And that was one conversation, me, random idiot, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, I'm not the most articulate guy in the world, just going on a Trump supporter show and like calmly without, you know, never checking them or becoming super antagonistic or looking for a gotcha moment, just having a conversation and being very real about what I've seen and how I feel has probably changed more minds than 90% of these screaming Twitter left leftists that just go on and attack everyone who disagrees with them. And I think like that's why people like Jimmy, why let people like Daryl, why people probably like everyone on the show and people like me get so much hate is it's this weird form of jealousy of like they feel like they can't do this, even though they perfectly could. Most of them are perfectly capable of doing what I'm doing right now. But they're not doing it and they get mad and they get really upset that they're seeing people 
be more effective in what they want to do than they are and this they attack and attack and demonize i think it's also this weird thing of um this exclusionary club like they want to be able to sit smugly in their little echo chamber and feel superior they um it's this weird thing where they think that they are um you know the moral authority and that you know they you if, if you are outside their circle then you're um irredeemable and they have, want nothing to do with you and to me that seems really bizarre because either you want to be right or you want to win and i don't really care about being right i just want to get things done um and I, i'm an assange activist i'm a free speech activist and i when i when we started action for assange the whole basis of it was to be post-partisan we were going to welcome anybody in who wanted to support free speech free press and assange and we have done that and we have been effective at it and i don't agree with everybody cassandra Fair fairbanks and i have very little in common but right. she is an ally to me in the fight for free speech because she is um, an effective organizer and activist in that realm. And I'm not going to like go party with her, but if she, I can work with her on this to save the first amendment, <laughs> I think that's a worthwhile venture. Right. Like, like I mean, bodies ridiculous. on the ground, bodies on the ground in numbers and levels of voices are important. So it's like, we can argue about any issue, pick an issue all you want, but can we just come together for this moment and just not and that that like a lot of people ask me, like, what's your key to like talking to three percenters and Alex Jones and then BLM activists and Antifa and like not getting into shit fights with them is because I, I just don't bring up anything we disagree on. I just don't talk about it. And if they say something I disagree on, I'm like, oh, and I just continue on the conversation. So if we could like everybody do that and just like have these flashpoints like this Wall Street bets thing or like Assange or like anti-war or, you know, you know, drug decriminalization, everything. If we could just stop all these slap fights over these issues and just shut up for a day and all show up to the same place and don't argue and don't get into fights and don't get an ego and bring up all these things and how you feel about it and try to warp it. Just be yeah. very singular and focused and one issue at a time. We can nope. knock out these problems and solve these problems together. And then we can go back to warring over capitalism and socialism, free, free healthcare or private healthcare. But Landis, until then, what, like, <laughs> Landis, what do you think that uh, the folks who think like you would think about, uh, there's a movement here for a general strike and basically you know that's putting nobody at risk it's basically saying stay home don't work uh whatever it is don't buy anything don't run the internet um yeah. and exercise some power that way other people are talking about activities like you know everybody goes out and takes out half their balance in their bank account on one day yeah and, and that would cause so, so much damage and like like a lot you know a lot of people like they're like do the rent strike and i'm like do a mortgage strike like, go yeah. to your landlord and be like, hey, I'm not going to pay you rent, and you shouldn't pay your mortgage or your property taxes. Work together with your landlord and say, fuck you. We're, we're, we're both check, both of us are checking out. You know, or like, you talk about volunteerism. What if we all withdraw our money and decide to help each other instead? Yeah, let's exactly. Pay off, let's pay off each other's mortgages. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that, that, that was like, that kind of touches on, because I get a lot, like, the most hate I get from the left is my stance against lockdowns. But it's very important because you want someone like me showing up to anti-lockdown protests. Because when you go to these anti-lockdown protests, it is literally normal people that are very desperate and they didn't receive a stimulus check. They didn't get a bailout. They are not getting unemployment. They're literally starving. And then you have conservatives, hardcore conservatives, and then far right people. And no one else is talking to them. Nobody's helping them. Nobody's reaching out and paying their bills. And a lot of them have gone from left to right just because they'll reach out to their left-wing friends and be like, I understand that the virus is dangerous and the lockdowns are important, but I'm struggling. Will you help me? And they'll be like, oh, are you an anti-masker? You know, just shut up. You know, go work at Walmart. You're, you know, small businesses. You know, what, what is a business worth compared to a life? And all these talking points. And it's like, these people are desperate. So you should be very happy that there are libertarians showing up to these events and talking to these people and being like, hey, I'm willing to help you. I agree with you. Don't listen to the dude with the swastika tattoo over there, even though if I wasn't there, that'd probably be the only person talking to you. And when you have and, desperate people, they become very malleable to extreme ideas. And, and then you have someone, people try to kidnap the fucking governor. Huh. <laughs> you know, well, like, just, I think it was about an hour ago, <laughs> just about an hour ago, uh, anti that that this is the the media line on this was they were anti-vaxxers but people came to shut down a large vaccination center in la and lapd closed down the vaccination center rather than disperse the people who are trying to stop it and they described them as anti-vaxxers but i'm looking and this just happened so i don't really know but i'm looking at videos and people are have signs up to say it's only 66 percent effective you know it's 
you know, the, the, and the problem is really going to be if we want to get the herd immunity and we believe vaccines are the way to get there, if people don't want to take them, how are we going to force them to take these vaccines? I mean, right. Right. If, if you don't well, get the 50 being to skeptical, being skeptical about a vaccine that's been rushed through is not anti-vax. There is absolutely no way anybody could ever call me anti-vax. I actually made a hit list, not a hit list, but like a uh, careful, like a list careful. that you know. <laughs> yes, but like anti-vax or anti-vaxxers got pissed off and a made like list. a list of people that they felt were you know like troublemakers, and I'm on that list from 2015. So there's no way anybody could ever call me anti-vax. I am not getting that vaccine. It is rushed through. It is not as effective as it could be. There is no reason why being skeptical about something that's that rushed and that um, unknown should be labeled as anti-vax. That's just common fucking sense. Yeah, that's no. just common sense. You're having something injected into your body. You want to know what that is, what it does, um, you know, all of those things. That's it's it's bizarre to me that that's being considered anti-vax. Right, and there's that this this just weird thrust on the on the left of just looking at these average normal people that are scared and desperate and treating them as evil. Like literally evil. Like like when I went to the lockdown protest, even though it was run by the Republican Party of Michigan, when I actually talked to a lot of these people, there was so many non political people there. People that maybe like a vote voted for Obama and then have never voted for anyone else in their life just because that was a moment. They don't participate in local politics. They probably don't even watch the news. But they're fucked. They're they're so desperate. They're so screwed. Their businesses are closed. They're laid off. They're not getting any help. And only one half of the political aisle is reaching out to them. So it's like, that's bad. You want to reach out as a leftist. Maybe you can go there as a leftist group and be like, hey, let's actually not stop the lockdowns, but let's organize a community charity. Let me help you pay your bills off so you don't get your house foreclosed on and put on the street, which has happened to a lot of people. You know, like, let, let me help you. And that's that kind of like the unity things of, of the whole reason these lockdown protests are happening is, yeah, there are some people that are more liberty and more freedom about it. And yeah, there are some conspiracy theorists about it. But a lot of people just they don't know what to do and they're desperate. So reach out to those people and offer solutions instead of being an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think before you get mad at those people who are there, you also have to um, question the fact that, you know, our elected officials are telling everybody that we have to stay home, but then they don't stay home. They go and have birthday parties at restaurants and they fly to Maui for trips and they're, you know, doing all of these things. And so, I mean, of course, people are then going to be skeptical about right. being told that they have to stay home. And I'm not like anti lockdown or anti masker or any of those things. Right. But if you want people to stay home, then you need to make sure that they have the ability to do that and survive. And if you're not going to do that, then you can't be mad at people who need to survive for being pissed off that you're preventing them from doing that. I right. mean, and like, you know how much you know how much respect I would have for politicians if instead of them going out and get their hair done and makeup or whatever it was like day 200 of the lockdown and elizabeth warren comes on and her hair's all grown out and fucked up and she has raging roots and a bit of a mustache <laughs> coming in i'd have way more respect for you i'd be like you are struggling just like i'm struggling i get that but instead you see them and they're all nice clothes and you know, makeup and they're getting their hair done and they're going out and partying it's like no wonder people are mad if you well, like how do you blame people <laughs> Right, Someone you know, to protect us. The capital um, has to look clean and pure, no matter what, you know. <laughs> yeah. So just just getting back to this, uh, to the idea of the, the the decentralization of the Boogaloo Boys, um, and how that's been spun in the media and the the censorship that's resulted in. I'm curious, uh, both Magnus and Bruce, of of your take on this, but. I think it's because of that decentralization that the media and those in power, which basically have a symbiotic relationship, they can't put a finger on somebody like you um, or your comrades and, and the good work you've done. Um, and part of that, I think, for the media is because it doesn't sell newspapers. It doesn't get ratings. And <clears throat> it's much easier to point to the example of um, someone who claims to be a boogaloo boy and commits an act of violence somewhere and then attribute, attribute that in a blanket statement to the whole group uh, and to everyone who's involved with it. And I think it's that decentralization that gets people so angry is that they can't pigeonhole you. And I think that they also know that a lot of what you stand for is right. It's human. It's humane. So I'm wondering what both of you think about that and if that's 
that's one of the primary reasons why we're we're hearing Nazi and neo-Nazi and fascist and similar terms thrown around with with really no regard to what they actually mean and who the people are uh, to whom they're being applied. Yeah, uh, def- so, so you go for you go first. So, I mean, the way the way they do these things is, you know, uh, it it needs to be summarized for people in soundbite, or then they have to have the talking points. It was amazing to me similar situation with the, the Reddit people, you know, the next day after uh, they opened up the after hours trading and these guys started to drive the stock price down, you have people, two people, all the forums I saw, Ben Norton, other people saying, you know, this is a casino scheme by these Reddit people. It's like, wait a minute, <laughs> you call things a scheme, we don't like it, like Medicare for all was a scheme. So you, right away you hear something's going on, you know, it's not a scheme. As a matter of fact, casinos are more regulated than the stock market. So. You know the stock market's fraudulent it's not that it's a it's a reddit scheme so but it's a way they want to pin this thing on there and just move the narrative forward because they know the problem is people are going to want to work together and they want to get something done and we can't fucking have that above all things we can't have that mm-hmm. yeah and, and definitely like like with us i i definitely think it's part of they couldn't pigeonhole us but i also think we were throughout the whole george thing floyd thing we were very screwing we were screwing up their hustle because just like you said, we, you know, calm and unity does not sell. What sells is chaos. And when you have a group like us that's showing up to these events and making it to where the police can't attack the protesters, and then the protesters retaliate, and then it turns into a fight between cops and protesters, and then random people from all the neighborhoods start appearing randomly and start breaking into shops and everything, all the opportunists, you know, materialize out of nowhere. That's money. But armed group stands between cops and protesters and it's just a big kumbaya and everyone goes home and nobody gets hurt. That's bad. And even like it's covered, it's sensationalized. Right. And that, that and a lot of times, like they would actively attempt to do what they accuse us of doing, of causing an incident to where, particularly at the Garrett Foster Memorial, which was the second largest event we ever had. There's about 32 of us that traveled all across to go to Garrett Foster's Memorial because he was one of us beforehand and we talked to local shop owners beforehand the police in austin had gone around and told shop owners that they expected a group of armed individuals and they had received reports that they were going to take over these shops and set up sniper positions and that they need to you know give their give their building over to the police for access and scared the shit out of everybody and obviously the rumors went through them into the crowd So when we showed up, even though everything was public on Facebook, we didn't do any organizing behind closed doors. We told everybody exactly where we would show up, exactly who was going to show up, pictures of what we looked like and everything. When we showed up, everybody was kind of freaked out for a second because the police themselves had spread information out to hope something bad happened. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And that isn't the only place that we've had that happen at. That happened the same thing in Milwaukee to where people told the the leader of the organizer there that there were people coming to assassinate him. (laughs) Like... Yeah, so and like, we, we, they, they try to do this stuff. We've seen the video of uh, cops getting ready for a George Floyd protest, li- uh, laying out bricks uh, along the route protesters would be taking purposely to provoke violence, which seems to me like such a ham fisted, um, but probably in line with the intelligence of a cop's way to do it. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it, it's not. It's not unreal, and it happens all the time. It happens all the time. That's, I, I called out Alex Jones on that on his show because, like, I told him, like, you did a documentary all the way back in the 90s about the WTO riots and how they were peaceful protests until cops pretending to be protesters, pretending to be proto-Antifa, looks exactly the same, started fights with cops, and then the cops cracked down. And now Are you you're talking co- about the black block? Yeah, the, okay. the black block in WTO. Yeah, and it was like it was like yeah, you you were the one who did a documentary proving that there was police officers pretending to be protesters to instigate fights with the cops, right. and now you're turning around and accusing some of these same people because the people I talked to are some of the people that are at WTO of now being illegitimate protesters, and I even called them like you don't you you don't think the cops are still using these same tactics? You don't think a lot of the bad things you've heard about BLM are either a combination of lone crazy individuals that paint an entire movement, same thing they do with us. Or direct infiltration from chaotic, you know, random chaotic agents or the police or other people that are trying to stir stuff up and cause problems so they can beat up a bunch of protesters. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think that that's it's confusing to me why um, people on the quote unquote left don't get it because this they do this to us all the time. I mean, they lie about our movements, they infiltrate our movements, they um, you know try to discredit our movements from within. Like this is and so you know when I was doing research on Boogaloo Boys and I was you know seeing all of these things um, that you guys have actually done and then reading about what the media how the media was spinning it, it was because here's the thing uh, people have been saying oh but there's this there's this um message thing on slack where they're all talking about how they infiltrate the left and they're going to trick the left and blah 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 and okay that's fine but i trust on the ground um stuff more than i trust anything on social media on the internet these are anonymous people making posts on some website somewhere and i've seen the videos of the Boogaloo Boys putting their bodies on the line and, you know, getting into fistfights with Proud Boys and, you know, and, you know, going after the cops and getting into, you know, shouting matches with them or whatever. And so to me, it's like real life is what matters. And so it's it's really weird that people on, you know, the left don't understand how that could also be used um, against somebody like the Boogaloo Boys. And I'm not saying that, like, the Boogaloo Boys are perfect or that I think that, you know, I don't even say all, that. You know, yeah. No, I mean, like, that's, I don't even say that. <laughs> I mean, listen, you know, there is there are there people in the, the Boogaloo Boy movement who are racist or white supremacist? I'm sure there are. There are racist on the left. Um, racism is very prevalent. The on the left. Left. It, it's uh, it, yes. We, uh, well, he's not on the left. Yeah. Let's not pretend that. Joe oh, sorry, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's not of the left. Oh, um, uh, but yeah, left, but I, that's another planet. thing, though. That's, that's another thing, though, that, you know, that I have people calling me a, a racist and a Nazi because um, I want to have conversations with regular people with whom I may have disagreements with. But they voted for a segregationist. Right. It's a yeah. very bizarre that was, thing. That was that was Nico's like, like, I didn't even know that he made that video. But the one, you know, Nico House put on of he's like, you call I've, I'm watching these guys put their bodies on the line. And y'all told you all were bullying people a month ago to vote for a segregationist. Segregationist. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that's but real so talk, funny. though. I mean, what kind of hypocrisy does it take for you to label me as or anybody or to label Magnus as a fascist or a, 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 a racist when you just voted for one? I mean, it's this weird, um, I, don't, I don't know, like cognitive dissonance or I don't know what it's it very, is. It's but very it's Orwellian. Weird... It's very it's very double thing to where it's just like, like, I, I love that video with Glenn Greenwald that you shared today, because he even laid it out in the beginning where he like walked through like, hey, do you think Facebook is bad? Yes. Do you think the government is bad? Yes. Do you think these corporations are bad? Yes. Do you want them to all censor the people you disagree with? Yes. It's like, <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> like, you, you, you don't, you're, you're, it's not even that you have double think. It's just you're literally not even thinking. I feel like it's so like reptile brain reactionary just in yeah. the moment. There's no consistent line of thinking. It's just whatever log onto Twitter, everyone's mad at this, I'm also mad at this. Yeah, yes. it's very, it's very, it's very emotionally, very emotionally based. And um, yes. I think- It's I think mob what, mentality. I think what's cruelly ironic about the current situation uh, with the Boogaloid, uh, Boogaloo Boys being Boogaloid? banned- I like Boogaloid. <laughs> Boogaloid. I like That's Boogaloid. A new one. I'm stealing that. <laughs> I love that Glenn, Green, Glenn Greenwald's a Boogaloo Boy. Did you see that? That was amazing. Oh, you know, Glenn Greenwald thing. Someone said, Milo, someone said Milo Yiannopoulos is a boogaloo boy. And I'm uh, like, where no, the between, fuck did that come from? <laughs> between the, uh, between like, the Hawaiian, no, between the Hawaiian joke, references and, and the uh, gamer references that are on Magnus' timeline, I'm like, I get so confused. It's like, what the heck is he talking about? The fuck, you know, Ohana. And I'm like, okay. But, you know, I, under, I understand that's like, you know, that's just something that you guys have a, a common. You grew up with that kind of stuff with the gamer and whatever those other things are. But. People see that as alien. And the other thing I mentioned, I think, to Magnus one time in his BM was that people are just fucking afraid of guns in any form. I mean, when you're out there with a gun anywhere, I mean, I'm in an open carry state. I have a pistol. I have a pistol because cat, uh, coyotes killed my feral cats and my BB mm -hmm. gun didn't work. So I went and bought an antique pistol. But I'm not afraid of people walking around with guns. It doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm afraid of a government with drones and, you know, tanks yeah. and police, uh, militarized police. That's what I'm afraid. Yeah, and, that, and that's and I, I don't I don't know if it was a police helicopter that was flying over you, doing circles over you. Military when you, helicopter. Military helicopter. Oh, there so was there, there was there, you there go. was six there was six Humvees over fifty National Guard, bicycle cops, horse cops, snipers on the roof in Lansing, like 
Like I, I was literally joking. I'm like, I wish I made a sign that just said like, ooh, woo, what are you looking at, Sniper Chan, to like hold it up? Because yeah. there was guys that were just scoping right up on us. And it's like, they're like, look at us. We're ridiculous. That's why I, I call ourselves like the vil village idiots. Like there is a part of the Boogaloo movement that is embrace the absurdity of what is happening. So like, <laughs> look at it. People are so terrified. Right. Anyway, anyway, to to your to your point about the the gun things, and that's it's, it's really weird because it's a it's a very very white people thing in my experience. It's an extraordinarily like suburban white people thing. Because when I was in downtown Detroit, and we were all suited up and kitted up and everything, and we weren't we weren't the only armed group there. There was local you know local black members of the community that were armed. There was a two Antifa people that identified as John Brown Gun Club there. They were all in the same place. And all of like the college you know, white kids were all like really weird about us and everything, but uh, uh, you know, I think like middle middle aged black woman with her three kids and one of them in a stroller walked by and like walked up to me and like, that thing looks awesome. I'm so happy you're here. Are you here for the event and everything? Like casual as be because she probably lives in Detroit where there's crime and violence and people are dying. She's not in a safe little perfect bubble. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of like the confusion on like, oh, why are you at these protests with guns? It's like because where you're at, it's calm and safe. These protests, people are dying. People are shooting each other. The cops are fucking people up. Things are getting lit on fire. Like, it's not this little happy bubble where we walk down the street and say kumbaya. Like, we, like I said, we, ha we have casualties. BLM has casualties. Antifa has casualties. Proud boys have died. Cops have died. Like, yeah, and, and, what, you know? <laughs> and what people, people need to remember, too, is the origin of the word ghetto and how that origin still applies today. Although in the U.S. we see it mostly applied to black and brown communities. And I think, <clears throat> again, that speaks to uh, the perversion of language that's taken place in our culture, um, but also a lack of historical context and historical knowledge. So people have given you shit, Magnus, because of not just your, not just the positions you've taken, but because of uh, whom you've chose to uh, speak to even uh, or look at. Uh, though it seems like if you roll over in bed, somebody's going to launch into a formal complaint. But there's there's precedence for this. Um, and one of them, Misty and I were talking about before the show, was uh, what happened in Waco in the early 90s. And it was a 51-day standoff where you had the ATF coming in uh, on Janet Reno's uh, orders. And because it was such a long standoff, I, I don't know if you remember, but there were people would come daily to camp out sort of along the road. And one of those people was Timothy McVeigh. Another one of those people was the comedian, the late comedian, Bill Hicks. I couldn't yeah. think of two more different people uh, in a, in pretty much every sense. But I think that points to uh, something you spoke about in Jimmy Dore's video, uh, interview, I'm sorry, um, that people all over this country have different political stances or viewpoints or uh, ideologies even. And, but journalists nowadays uh, who are in interested mostly in clickbait and entertainment and ratings, they don't want to do that historical diving to realize that there is precedence for this crossover. I'm not saying that Bill Hicks and Timothy McVeigh were in league, but I'm talking about how two people from diametrically, or maybe not diametrically opposed, but severely opposed um, political standpoints were both outraged by the same government perpetrated event. And I think that's a key point that we have to home in on rather than, uh, for lack of a better term, the identity politics that is being smeared all over you and the Boogaloo Boys and you talking to Jimmy Dore and all this sort of uh, infantile drama uh, that's resulted from it. Yeah, like, yeah. like po politics are so complicated. Like, I, it was funny because at that, at that very event, the most like perfect example of how things are not nearly as simple as, as the media pretends to be that one video where I'm speaking to that man and I'm standing there, I'm smoking a cigarette, I'm talking, that's been going around. He, he He's biracial, he's half black, he's an ex-felon, he voted for the Green Party, but he's a Trump supporter. So like, put that man in literally any box, I dare you, to try to figure out how to politically identify that man. 
Right. And like that's that's America. Like like nobody if you actually sit down and particularly with like you said, with language, if you get rid of the labels and you define your terms, like don't go, this is my definition of capitalism, your definition's wrong. No, go like, what does capitalism mean to you? What does freedom mean to you? What is and you define these terms and you get down more and more, you realize that like not only are we vastly different, almost every single one of us, but we also agree on everything that's important. So it's like yeah, right, but the media doesn't want to do that. The media wants tight knit bubbles that really nobody fits in. Yeah. Well, they have to have us on teams. That's mm-hmm. that's how they keep us distracted and fighting amongst ourselves. If they can pigeonhole us all into teams, then we aren't focusing on the real problems. I mean, this it really is. I mean, I mentioned it earlier to you on War and Wall Street. There is one party. On everything else, they use that stuff. Um, to keep us fighting amongst each other. I mean, the, the, are there some Republicans who are really, really serious about their position on abortion? Sure. But for the yeah. most part, I don't think they give a fuck. As long as they yeah. have their donor money coming in and they can perpetrate another war and they're comfortable and they don't have to worry about anything, I really don't think most of them give two shits about it. Right. I that, really don't think that, most of that, them that, care. That, that Go goes ahead. exactly to, like, like I told you I had, uh, in that tweet, I had, like, a perfect example I wanted to bring up about how both these parties are fake. It's through my life that there's two issues that are totally bullshit and they just they don't even exist when it comes to politics when you really think about it. And that is guns and abortion, because throughout my entire life, we have had multiple Democrat supermajorities and multiple conservative supermajorities. And yet I, I my gun rights, I haven't gotten more gun rights and I haven't lost that many. I haven't gotten more abortion rights or lost that many bo- abortion rights. It's been they want the issue. Bitter. Yeah, because they know and they're perfectly aware that if they actually solve these problems, if either side won, whether it be abortion was completely banned tomorrow or it was totally free, whether I could go buy a Tomahawk cruise missile at Walmart or I wasn't allowed to own a muzzle loader, uh, either way, if either side won, then they wouldn't have they would have nothing to get elected on. You know, how many how many women would vote for the Democratic Party if abortion wasn't an issue? Well, Probably a lot less. How many Republicans would there even exist if gun rights weren't a debated issue? Like that whole party would probably collapse because I, I genuinely feel like 25 percent of the Republican voting base is just people that are worried about the Second Amendment. So it's yeah. like they, they need those two issues so desperately to stay alive that they will never solve the problem. Well, no, the they're... Democratic Party is also now using Medicare for all as their little um, fallback. It's, you know, yeah. they didn't want to do the force the vote thing. Um, they don't want to actually fight for it. Even the progressives, um, you know, they need they're going to campaign on that. They're going to campaign on it in 2022. So, they're going to get wiped out and then they're going to blame the Republicans. And it's it, it, this is it's it's really bizarre to me that grown adults cannot recognize the pattern. Right. It is same, a clear and obvious pattern. Like, like Trump, Trump, like the three things Trump really ran on when you like boil it down simple was like immigration reform, which barely fucking happened. And then you had get rid of Obamacare. And and when did that ever happen? You know? Right. So like, again, he, he can't solve that issue because if he solves that issue, he won't get elected again. So we're going to yeah, keep this weird middle ground corporate healthcare system that's neither public or private. It's this weird, you know, corporate middle ground nonsense forever because that's how both parties get votes. They will never actually solve the issue. Yeah, and if you actually, I mean, I, of course, one of my core beliefs is that a lot of our problems go away when you get rid of income inequality. And you, you talk about, um, you know, abortion, for example, if you're really pro-life and you want there to be less abortions, then you ought to want less people being desperate because a lot of times people decide not to have a child because they don't have money or you know it's just one of those situations but if if people are less desperate you're going to get less abortions if what you want is less abortions that's a way to go if you want to ban something you're going to be fought forever and it's never going to happen and more babies are going to die so it's it's, it's the same thing with the the, yeah the the contraception issue the the gun issue like so there's so many of these issues like you, you try to talk to people and it's like hey you know if we solve the core problem, then we won't have to argue about this anymore. Like, we'll, right. we'll talk about guns less if we can focus on mental health more. We can talk about, you know, teen pregnancy or whatever, more, like, less if we can talk about education more. But, like, they, th- those are complicated answers. Right. And easy, the easy answer is just to drop the hammer and, and do the stupid, simple thing. And, and you, can tell, you can tell that the so-called liberals or Democrats or faux leftists, however you want to brand them, you can tell that they actually don't give a fuck about what's happening uh, with regard to school shootings, for example, 
because how many have there been? How many uh, public mass shootings have there been? And they do nothing. They're constant. They constantly say they're locked in a stalemate. And you know that if it was something that was hammering in their heart that they wanted to get accomplished, that they would be up there in front of Congress screaming every day about it. Uh, That's just, how they raise money. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> just just like they would about the the financial uh, monoliths uh, whom they defer to all the time. Uh, AOC lied when she, when she said she gave uh, a no voice vote to the CARES Act. And there are some independent journalists who didn't even, some good independent journalists who didn't even know that until a few weeks ago or a month ago. And that's insane that she was able to get away with that narrative for, I guess, what is now the largest upward transfer of wealth or maybe the second largest. But, you know, so, something something they can decide overnight, essentially, with the voice vote that has no accountability. But a six hundred dollar check for people like us is it takes them months upon months. Listen, they, they give they billions of dollars to the military industrial complex like that. There's no yeah. conversation. There's no debate. They just do it. But it takes yeah. six months for them to maybe give us six hundred dollars. Yeah. You I mean, I don't know how. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how much more obvious it could be that this, uh, you know, um, they don't work for us and they never have. They're never going to. Um, and it's a really bizarre thing that people like put these politicians on, like pretend like they're friends, like they're they're, you know, you can't criticize them. You get, you know, attacked if you dare to criticize any of them. Um, I, I've been taking shit for four years because I've been criticizing Bernie Sanders. And it's it's bizarre. It's, you know, I don't know when politics became this uh, cult of personality. Like, I call them celebriticians. Yeah, celebr they're not politicians. They're celebriticians. <laughs> That's you know what I'm saying? Like, th this is more about their brand. It's more about, you know, can they get a book deal or can they, you know, these people do not give a shit about you. They're psychopaths. I mean, I'm not saying that, like, hyperbolically. Like, no, they are I mean, psychopaths. I, actually, I'm pretty convinced, you know, I think as homo sapiens, I think psychopaths are the ones that are favored to probably succeed. So if we don't stop the psychopaths now, we're going to have a hard time down the road. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, I, 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 I interviewed... I interviewed journalist uh, Max Blumenthal uh, earlier last year, and we talked about this cult of personality uh, issue, essentially. And he said the same thing, that you have to be a psychopath to want to be president of the United States, or probably any nation for that matter. And these people are dangerous, and they will do anything to protect their power. And unfortunately, that's been embedded in the collective consciousness as hyperbole or overreaction and it's really not and we're seeing that it's really not now but people don't want to a lot of people don't want to accept that or um you know have to deal if they accept it have to deal with uh the consequences of accepting that but i wanted to uh touch upon the the second amendment because i know that's been contentious uh among the the chatter uh, surrounding the Boogaloo Boys. And I'd like to get both of your uh, positions on the Second Amendment, you know, straight from the, the horse's mouth, as it were. I think, well, for where I, from where I sit, um, it's, it's had a long life, a long history, but the Second Amendment and every single amendment is basically, the meaning of it is what it is at the time based on what the Supreme Court says about it. I mean, we put Japanese people in prison and that was okay according to the Supreme Court during World War II. And right now, the Second Amendment applies to individuals and their right to bear arms. That's the way it's been interpreted. And uh, people that don't understand that are like, you know, we can regulate, we can make people have license. And it's like, just like driving. Driving gets better when people are licensed. And it's like, well, you know, driving isn't a constitutionally protected right. So if you want to change the Constitution, that's one way to fix things. But, you know, Magnus and I have talked about bans and why bans don't work, and he went, into a long uh, explanation to people, you know, you ban guns, you can 3D print them. You ban ammo, you can make your own ammo at home. It's like it becomes a black market. So mm -hmm. it's not about taking the guns away. I mean, most of the gun violence in this country is suicide and it's people dying by handguns. I mean, you literally, last statistics I saw, 2017, according to the FBI, more people were killed by feet and fists than were killed by long rifles. So mm -hmm. we're not looking at the right thing. We're, we need to look at the desperation and what makes people kill other people and kill themselves. 
Yeah, and de- definitely to that point, like like immediately to my right off camera, I have two 3D printers. Like if, if you, in pretty much like we've Ooh. we've been going on for an hour and a half. I could have half of a half of the parts I would need to make a rifle almost halfway done printed, and then I would just need some basic machining tools, and I have a gun. Mm-hmm. Especially like like the 3D printing has really kind of put the whole gun control thing to death because the average person now with barely any technical knowledge and just like seven hundred dollars can just be making rifles all they want all they want they can get these and then on the other end of that you're starting to see kind of the death of the second amendment being a conservative thing with groups like the armed equality movement which is popping up with the socialist rifle club with john brown i'm a member yeah yeah with you know with nfac and all these groups coming up and and kind of like the chaos of this year and how everything went down kind of teaching people like oh yeah like it looks like the world's coming apart we have i think it was like 30, I think what was like 13 million, 10 million or something like that background checks or something of like 20, you know, millions and millions of new firearms owners, mostly black and women firearm owners for the first time. And like one of our guys, Mike Dunn, which is another dude that he's been in the media and everywhere, like his whole pretty much the way he pays his bills is giving firearm training to people. And almost every single one of his customers are black and black men and women. So it's like yeah. that's that. That whole idea of just like like guns belong to white dudes is dying, and you're seeing a lot more people come out. And even in Virginia, we had the individual that showed up with a trans pride flag in full kit with an AR-15. So it's yeah. like, like yeah. They, you know, and and it's funny because like, I think that's the one the one thing that you know I don't see conservatives get really riled up about. To where the only event I ever saw where you had Antifa and conservatives together and there was no arguments was the Virginia gun rally where John Brown Gun Club showed up and the conservatives were just like, hey, you like guns too? And they just yeah. like vibed, you know? And nobody talked about anything else in that moment. And it was just that moment of kind of like unity and everything. And then the most recent Virginia gun rally, you had Black Panthers, you had the Socialist Rifle Association, you had local militias, and you had Boogaloo Boys, and we were all just down there. So I, I, I definitely think that like the, this... The gun control argument is so dead with the combination of it's not just white dudes anymore. It's not just conservatives anymore. And the fact that the average person can get their hands on a firearm so quickly and so easily and make their own if they have to, that I just don't see how you would be able to regulate it. You would have to make so many things illegal in 3D printing and, you know, parts from Home Depot or Ace Hardware that I can go get that. That's all that's required. (laughs) I don't think think there are people that want to do that, though. Uh, they'll they'll want to regulate anything if it if it, you know it yeah like, I don't underestimate the yeah. government to go way overboard and just literally ban like like a lot of people are like oh you know we'll make three D printing gun files like child porn and I'm like one uh, not a lot of people that have child porn get caught not that much at all compared <laughs> to the mass volumes out there the amount of people that go to jail for it very small and the other thing is is that like it's one file. Like when you when you see people that get arrested for like child porn because it's such a fucked up thing and they're such deranged people, it's usually like millions of images or hundreds of thousands of images of child pornography to where like I can literally have a flash drive with a single CAD file on it and print a gun. Mm-hmm. So like, how are you going to regulate that? How are you going to moderate that? You know, if you think that there isn't ways to get information off the internet, you're you're high if you think you're going to be able to regulate that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, I mean, banning something. There are so many guns in this country already. Banning it is it's just never going to work. And bans never work. I mean, it's the same thing with censorship. It's you know, all you do is exacerbate the problem. I, I think you said on Jimmy Dore that you know, since you guys have been censored and like kicked off the internet, it's much more difficult for you guys to deal deal with, um, you know, maybe the bad actors who are, are, you know, in your midst. And that's, that's the problem. It's like, you cannot, um, you know, ignoring a problem doesn't make it go away. That's, you know, I think people need to recognize that you can't ignore a problem away. Um, It's kind of the same thing when people don't want to talk to people that they don't agree with. Well, me ignoring that they exist doesn't make them go away. Right. (laughs) A lot of people, they they exist, they exist so much on the internet that I think they imagine there's almost a block button in real life. And that's just not how this applies. These people don't disappear just because you get rid of them. And it's, it's, it's really sad too, because I I brought up an example a couple podcasts ago. I forget who exactly I mentioned it on, but there was an instance where one of our guys on our biggest page that had like 10,000 members, he just like flew off the handle one night. He was depressed. Like, I I don't know if like his girlfriend broke up with him or he lost his job or something. He's like, fuck it. I'm going out and I'm just going to start shooting cops. And he gets on Facebook Live and gets in his car and he's like playing music. He's like, I'm going to go kill cops. 
every single person on that page. We called people and woke people up in the middle of the night and got them in that chat and we're calling his phone be like, dude, don't do it. Go home. This is stupid. This isn't going to solve anything. This is worse. You, you don't want to do this. Now I can't do that. So, you know, they're, they're yeah. like, now, now we cannot regulate these people. And I, I'm almost amazed that we haven't had more instances of bad actors than we have, especially because after we got censored, very few, very little has happened. But very easily, there could be a group of people that are just like, you know what, we're going to go blow up the local police station. And there's none of us around to, like, talk them down or like, talk them out of it. And you, you see the same thing, you know, like, in when it comes to entire movements being painted with it. Like, you don't see the BLM movement being painted with the guy in Dallas that ambushed those six cops and shot all of them. Because that's stupid. Because that's one guy in a movement of thousands and thousands. You don't see, you know, like on the left, they do not pay Antifa for the guys that, you know, hit that one kid in the Sriracha shirt over the bike lock. That doesn't mm -hmm. represent all, Ant of all of Antifa because that's stupid. And the same reason of us, like we're barely a year old. We're thousands and thousands of people and you have exactly five instances of bad things happening for thousands and thousands of people. Like if we're going to go on that scale, then we're cleaner than a lot of movements that exist. So don't go on that scale because it's wrong. That's not how the world works. Yeah, and for, for a nascent uh, movement, uh, if you will, for lack of a better word, it's, it's very interesting and telling to me that most of uh, the narrative that's been spun around the Boogaloo Boys, which has come from opposition uh, stations, um, they don't acknowledge that it's a nascent movement, that you are decentralized, that you haven't coalesced into anything. And it's like they're trying to write the narrative for what the Boogaloo Boys are as the Boogaloo Boys are figuring out what, yeah. what they and are. I, I think the censorship had to go with that because I, I even made a tweet about it that I really feel like they deleted all of our pages off of Facebook and all of our profiles. Because if that existed today and I went on Jimmy Dore today and I could just link the Big Igloo Boys page on Facebook and just scroll through that page, people would n not even be able to try to pretend we were white supremacists. Mm -hmm. From the stuff that was posted on there, from the, all the love on there and all, the, all everyone coming together and just uniform principles on everything, they would have failed if we had that point of reference. But I'm after sure, even, they, though, even though oh, you can't access it, I'm sure Zuckerberg has already given it to whoever asked him for it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, we know we're being watched for sure. And we've been yeah. visited by them <laughs> multiple times. But yeah. He probably sold it to them. One thing that you mentioned uh, in the DM, uh, Magnus, is um, you said that there were, like, bikers who were doxing you. Would, would they be considered, like, uh, white supremacists or pro-Trump, or who were they? Okay, so I had, I had three specific instances where private information were linked to me by the Internet. The, the first time was the AFA Vigilant account on Twitter, that linked my that leaked my docs and that was all the way back in june and then just a couple days after that the uh, group of neo-nazis on discord somehow got like aware of us and aware of me and were sharing pictures of me and calling me all sorts of great racial and gender slurs and everything and they started posting stuff like my mom's phone number my license plate stuff like that so i don't know where they got the information from and then around the same time is when I had people from the biker gang that was down in Detroit. I, I don't know if they're with that gang. I don't know. That's what I'm, I'm trying to. The point I'm trying to make here. I had people show up into my house and harass me and threaten me and call me a bunch of bad names. So I don't know who released what. I don't know where the original docs came from. I don't know where all this information got posted. But whether it be that Antifa account or those bikers or those neo Nazis, somebody got a hold of my full legal name that I haven't gone by forever. They've mm -hmm. gotten, they got a hold of my address, my license plate, my mom's address, you know, like my, you know, her phone number, my ex-girlfriend that I broke up with six months ago was getting calls being like, we're going to come and fuck you up and everything. And so it was like, so I got like, I, it's that whole Simpsons meme where it's, it's the swastika and the hammer and sickle put together. And it's like, we're under attack by Nazi commies. Like that's how it felt like. And I, I, I don't know who to blame for that because yeah, but weren't they on the same side during World War II? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I think yeah. Basically, the, power. I think people that do that are cowards. And you see, even right. all this cancel technology, I mean, cancel uh, culture is, is cowardice. Yeah. It just, and know, I, I, I don't know who cool. I don't know who to full full blame for it because I know the 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 AFA account posted my full name and posted like screenshots from my Facebook and everything. But I don't know 
if they went deeper and got my phone number and posted that on a message board or something and then the neo-nazis got it or did the neo-nazis get my phone number and dox me like but it, mm. but that that was a very horrifying like month of my life because like I was like I was like sleeping with my rifle and everything and like people were showing up to my house and I I was worried about people showing up to my mother's and trying to hurt her and it was like I to this day I don't know who to blame for that but that kind of just goes to show of like all at the same time the media wrote those stories the neo Nazis and like alt right people were against us we had the left wing totally turn on us the moment the news story started coming out. And then we just all, as an entire movement, felt very betrayed because some of us have died. Some of us are sitting in jail. Some of us have been very, like, wounded and hurt in support of the BLM movement just to get turned on because some idiots on MSNBC decided to make a bunch of shit up about us. So, like, yeah. that was a really, like, awful, like, couple months for every one of us. And it took a lot of, like, even within the movement to be like, no, I'm not going to give up. I'm still going to go out to BLM events, even though we're going to be called horrible things. So that that that's the other side of, like, these these idiot Twitter leftists, big quotes, is like, not not only did we march in support of BLM, we continued to show up after they were immediately suspicious and hateful of us in a lot of cases, and we still went to these events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and I think the proof is in the pudding there. Actions speak louder than words. And I wanted to... Well, first I wanted to just make an observation that I think what they're trying to do is destroy any kind of movement across political stances. Uh, I'm wary of, of uh, the word ideologies because I think that smacks too much of um, <clears throat> a figurehead of some sort rather than a decentralized community. So I think what, what they've been trying to do is, is to destroy the chance of that uh, from developing any farther. Um, but I think there's historical parallel with what happened to the Black Panthers. And a lot of these people who, especially on the left, who are decrying the Boogaloo Boys and, and you in particular, forget that the Black Panthers were an armed struggle movement, that they carried guns constantly. And this had to do not with, oh, they thought the government is going to take our guns away or some childish refrain like that. It was they had members of their community in Oakland, California, especially being murdered in the streets by police officers, white police officers. They shot 12 year old kids in the back uh, for running away from a candy store. And uh, Fred Hampton, as I'm sure you all know, was uh, a huge figure in the Black Panther movement. And he, I think, in a way parallels you and I'm, I'm hoping you don't. Know, hoping not too much. Hoping, yeah. <laughs> but, but but if if you study if you study if you read about Fred Hampton, uh, you can see that he was trying to reach across um, party lines, so to speak. Even though I don't mean political he parties. Trying, he was trying to transcend labels. He was like, was right, like, fuck all. Right. This. He was trying to unite. He was trying to unite the, was trying to unite the like, poor. And it class, and it terrifies. Class, class, class. Yeah, and it yeah. terrified the government to the point where they murdered him in his sleep while he was next to his his wife, and that's what they'll do. You you, the nail that sticks pregnant up gets wife, hammered down. His pregnant way. wife, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And that's that's kind of like like I'm now. This is a little long form. I can actually go into it. That's one of the things about the Duncan Lemp story that it's kind of in the background and not a lot of people talk about. Is Duncan Lemp also as being a he was a three percenter? He was also a big Jillian Assange advocate. He was also a very he worked a lot in blockchain and he was in before he died. He was actively working on a decentralized uh, cryptocurrency based messaging app that worked like Signal but would not be owned by anyone and anyone could use it. And there'd be no way to censor it or any company to arbitrarily decide like Keybase did to us. You'd be like, oh, we were a speech, free speech platform, but now we're just, you know, enough pressure was put on us, so we're kicking the Boogaloo boys off. He was working on that before he was murdered. Mm. And he, he was shot, very similar to Fred Hampton, he was shot in his bed through the window in a no-knock raid, and they shot his pregnant girlfriend who was laying in bed next to him. So it's like, that that's part of the Duncan Lemp story. Is he, he was very much like you, Missy, of like a very... Free speech warrior, big fan of Julian Assange, big fan of Andrew Snowden, uh, Snowden, <laughs> Snowden, you know, like, and he was killed while he was working on something that the government would really not like people to have their hands on. So it's like, 
Anyway, that has to happen, by the way. I'm excited now. That that has to. Something has I don't to know. I don't know that. if anyone anyone picked up his work because like the lockdowns and everything like that. But that that's yeah. one of, like the un, everyone was like, oh, he was a rabid militia three percenter dude. And it's like he was exactly like me. Like he like watched anime and played video games and like he would part. He liked the idea of the militia. He was a libertarian. He he you know participated in that. But he was mostly like a code junkie. And he was working on, you know, things very similar to something like Snowden and other people are working on and fighting the same kind of fight they were fighting on. And I've already seen people actively trying to go back and be like, they never heard Duncan's name before. It never been in their mouth. They know he's a victim of police violence, but they're doing the same thing the conservatives did to George Floyd, where they're going through all of his background. They're like, oh, he shared this one kind of edgy tweet. He's bad. Or like, oh, he was with the three percenters. He's bad. And it's like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> He was murdered. He was murdered by the cops. So it's yeah. like, and I can't, I can't believe the same people that would go after conservatives for pointing out George Floyd's criminal history would then immediately go around and try to demonize Duncan for whatever he was or whatever he did in his past. Yes, yeah. that's the problem, though. There's no intellectual intellectual consistency. People are not consistent across their beliefs, and that's, I mean, people, it, it's it's a really frustrating thing to deal with because I mean, I'm, I'm in no way perfect. I know I'm not always consistent, but that's something I always try to examine. And if you try to do that, people, it's foreign to them. They have no idea how to even react to the fact that I can criticize people across the spectrum. And it's this really weird hypocrisy that they don't even, I don't even know if they recognize it. Like, I don't even know if it's something that they um, are, are cognizant of that they're doing. Um, it's a really weird tribal thing yeah. and um, a, where that, our team did it. So it's fine, but your team did it. So it's bad. And it's yeah, there's, really bizarre. There's, there's, there's by design perfect, though. Yeah. That, that's, that's like probably like a perfect moment to like bring up something that uh, even, even uh, Jimmy Dore's producer kind of mentioned of the, the main thing that's being canceled on me is my, my stance on Kyle Rittenhouse. And this is perfect to go into this to where, when the Ahmad Amar Arbery thing happened, I got in a lot of trouble from people because I said Ahmad Arbery had the right to defend himself from those men that went and attacked him when he wasn't doing anything wrong. And the right screamed at me and freaked out. I mean, he was a criminal, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then the Kyle Rittenhouse thing happened. And in my opinion on that, that I've been very clear is I don't think Kyle should have been there. I think he was way out of his element. I think the, the adult militia people that he showed up with shouldn't have left him there alone and left the area, leaving a fucking 17-year-old kid running around a riot with a rifle. But mm -hmm. he had a right to defend himself. And the left screams at me and gets pissed at me and everything on that. But then you go to the Pinkerton agent that killed a proud boy in Denver. And I said, that Pinkerton agent had the right to defend himself from that proud boy. And the left was cheering that on, even though they were screaming about Rittenhouse earlier. And then the right was screaming at me for saying that Pinkerton agent had... The, had the right to defend himself from the proud boy who pushed him and pulled mace on him. So it's like, it, it's literally that of like, it's okay when our team does it. And it's the worst thing in the world when the other team does it. Yep. Very team sports. And even on the written house, I go even further to say that the, the, the first guy that attacked Kyle, the bald dude was an aggressive piece of shit, but the two dudes that went after him afterwards, the kid with the skateboard and the medic, I think that was very dumb, but that was also warrior shit like that was insanely brave those people because all they knew is that they heard someone was an active shooter and they saw a kid running by with a rifle and they tried to stop him i think mm -hmm. that's a dumb thing to do but that is also an honorable and very brave thing to do and i hold those men with respect the right hates that i say that they'll be like oh they'll, they'll all cheer on rittenhouse and i'll be like yeah he had the right to defend himself in the first one and they'll be like oh yeah and he shot those two scumbags afterwards and i'm like no and then the right screams at me so it's like yeah, <laughs> so many yeah. teams. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> like it's like, and and that's you what don't they care what happens. You care who did it and who they did it to. Well, and nobody's I... getting, nobody's getting mad at the bankers, and that's right. Yeah. All get... Right. Yeah. It's like, ugh. yeah, and it's and when I say it's by design, I mean it's it's designed by these companies, which are basically uh, wings of the government now. These tech companies like Twitter and Facebook, Instagram, etc they they sow this division by design with their algorithms, with their censorship, with the Twitter's new snitch feature. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, say goodbye and, to all of our accounts the moment that the fucking check marks get a hold of that. 
Yeah, I can't fun. believe I still have an account, to be honest. This is my third one. I'm amazed this one's lasted too this long. I, I, I'll expect it to be gone any day, just <laughs> disappear. But wow. part, of the, part of the reason they do that is not just to uh, divide us, but also to confuse us. So we can't tell, like what you just explained, you broke it down very carefully and it makes sense. But the way it's presented uh, on Twitter, for example, the way the feeds are now set up, the way the information you receive is now set up, it's so that you come away from even just a half hour on Twitter where you were trying to do something productive and you're, you're, your head is spinning because you don't know up from down anymore. But it, they do that on purpose because that's how they maintain their control. That's how they maintain their capital. And that's what they primarily exist for. And, I well, said, and something else that they do is silo everybody into their echo chamber. I mean, we've been talking about keeping us divided, that the algorithms very much do that. You are very much put into a box on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and it's very difficult to reach out to people who are outside of your little safe zone. And oh, I mean, it's something that I struggle with all the time because we've seen so much more support for Julian Assange on the right, which is bizarre. But, um, you know, I have to actively try to um, hijack uh, kind of right wing hashtags to even get attention from people on the right because I, the algorithm just will not show me in their feeds. It doesn't matter what I do. And so I have to like actively try to go and search for like kind of conservative hashtag to hijack to get attention on Julian Assange. Yeah, and that's really weird. All that approval is just creating a lot of dopamine inside your brain too. And that's like, that's why you're back there. You want all that approval from the people that are like you and you keep going back for that approval. But I just wanted to mention this because just before we came on, there was a tweet that I just saw from Marco Rubio, uh, who I'm no fan of, but he says, an effort to silence, intimidate, and wipe out dissenting voices by an oligarchy in legacy media, big business, and big government is now fully underway. And I'm like, wow. Wait, you said like, Marco Rubio? Marco Rubio. Welcome to the left. <laughs> I mean. Uh, well, he should tell no. that to Venezuela. Right. Yeah. That someone yeah. shared that. Fuck like, Marco Rubio. He's not welcome oh, yeah. on the left. That's the thing, though. Like, like no, I'll, I'll, I'll give a thumbs up when I can. I'm like, stop. Clock is right twice a day. You, you get it. Right. You know. I won't. I won't. I, I the thing I yeah. hate the most is when someone on the right or left says something good, and then you go into the reply. <laughs> then you then you go into the replies, and people are like, "Oh yeah. Well, what about your position on blah blah blah?" And it's like, just yeah. shut up. This like, happens with Tucker Carlson all the time, okay? <laughs> Tucker Carlson is a giant piece of shit, okay? He's a giant piece of shit. But he is amazing on Julian Assange, and I will give him credit for that. Um, you know, just before they were doing um, this last round of bullshit on Julian's case, he did three back-to-back-to-back -back -back nights having guests on to talk about Julian Assange. He had Stella Morrison, which is Julian Assange's partner. He has had Glenn Greenwald, Jimmy Dore, Pam Anderson, um, uh, I mean, just Chris Hedges, I think, uh, just like a multitude of people to speak about free, spe free speech, free press, and Julian Assange. And I can, um, two things can be true. Tucker Carlson can be a piece of shit and he can be right about Julian Assange. Those two things can coexist in the world and it can be okay. People right. that you do not like and do not agree with on most things can say and do good things and it is okay that that happens. Well, the thing um, is that you know, Marco, Marco Rubio is responsible for tens of thousands of deaths in Venezuela through sanctions right. that he supports. So he, I, he deserves to be taken to task and I don't trust him as being honest when he comes out and says something like oh, that. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I don't trust I, I, Carlson, I agree. I but that it's that still too. good that he does coverage. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's, yeah, I think that's, you know, there's, there's a, how, how do I explain this? Like, I, no, I, I meant Marco not, Rubio, I, not Tucker. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. With, with Marco Rubio, like, it's just like in that particular post, I would, uh, I wouldn't go after him on that particular post. Because like then you'll have concern like the way the conservative brain will work then when they view that is they're like wow Marco Rubio said something they agreed with and they just won't accept it no matter what you do you'll never win and then they'll just give up to where like you could just not on that post but on a separate post just continue to lay into them but just don't touch that one you know because yeah. it's a very optical kind of battle thing you know yeah but if if, if, he, if, he, if he means it he should be lobbying to stop the sanctions against venezuela so right. if, if he actually goes and does that that's something i'll support just like when trump went to uh north korea and tried to ne ne negotiate nuclear peace on the peninsula which uh an overwhelming majority of south koreans supported 
and uh, Moon Jae. Every American with a brain should support. Yeah, it's great. And, but, <laughs> but, but 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 of course, you had uh, the Liberati coming out and saying that no, this can't be. That he's a madman. Anybody but Trump. Well, just because it's not your preferred uh, ambassador to this process, what is the process? What is he actually trying to accomplish? And then it became not about tr what Trump was trying to accomplish there. It became about, you know, um, his friendship with Kim Jong Un, and every 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 mainstream narrative had these sort of um, friends with a dictator hom homo homoerotic undertones to it, just like <laughs> just like they did with Putin. And it, it's just so pathetic how they lose sight of the analysis so quickly, and it yep. devolves, and and it devolves to the point where they play an active role in ruining the chances of a serious peace that needs to be brokered between North and South Korea, a serious peace that could affect the rest of humanity. Right. But to them, it's just a, it's, it's a word. It's a, it's a numbers. It's a ratings game. Uh, it's a hyperbole game. Right. And um, so all of which is to say, I think I, I, I agree. I can agree with people. I fundamentally disagree with on certain things, but um, in other cases, it's like the proof is in the pudding. And with Marco Rubio, I don't see right. it. But I, I also agree with what you're saying about being tactical. Um, there are optics to it, so, especially you know now that anybody can just fire off a response or or dox you. Um, right. We've experienced. I think, I think so. Magnus is going to be working for a political candidate pretty soon. Maybe an independent <laughs> candidate. I, I mean, that, I, that, I, that I, that I did. Advice, I did. That arm Man, that's what I is. did. I did a uh, armed security for Spike Cohen during like his entire campaign, pretty much. Like I, I, I was in a couple places, like you know, because third party candidates don't get security when they're expected to you know go everywhere, but the two parties do. They get Secret Service and everything. So we, the Boogaloo's, did volunteer at almost every one of their events across the country, protection for the Libertarian Party. But I'm not much of that guy. <laughs> But uh, to, to like to that point, I guess would be a better example of like if I was at, you know, if there, if I was at like a, a, a pro-choice rally and Tucker Carlson showed up with a bunch of people that were pro-life, then I'm going to we're going to scream at each other. But if Tucker Carlson shows up at a free Assange event and is like, yeah, I'm here to support. I ain't saying shit. I'm not going to yell at him. I'm not going to bring up any other issue. I'm not going to criticize him at all. I'm going to be like, I am glad you're here. And I don't think a lot of people would be willing to do that. And that's a problem. Like, you know, it's a big problem. Yeah, he, he got really is. He, he got taken to task uh, for going on Tucker uh, and talking about Julian Assange. He got taken to task, uh, you know, again, by the Liberati. Well, why didn't you mention Medicare for all? Well, first of all, he wasn't invited on to speak about Medicare for all. So that would be, um, I think, Weird. disingenuous <laughs> right. to insert that in there if it, if it weren't relevant. And second of all, uh, Julian Assange is... If you don't know how hugely important the fate of this man is, then uh, I think you should do some research. But I feel like a lot of these people are young, and they're just they're they're too young to realize like how huge Jillian Assange was and how what he did nobody else ever had done before. Like right. when Wiki, well, when and it's Wiki not even about it, that. It was like, but that's yeah. not, they don't they don't under they don't understand of like oh why do you guys care about Jill, Jillian Assange so much blah 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 and it's like because because. It's a big deal because you don't understand like like what he did. No one else did before, and the government was so afraid of it. And that should tell you something that just he revolutionized journalism. Yeah, just I literally mean, having complete... a website. Oh, just having a website that you could post things to that the government yes. wants you to see. Like nowadays, people yes. like take that for granted. Back then, that was like holy no, that's... shit. Yeah. That's, that's, that's but people don't realize that it's so much bigger than Julian Assange. This, yeah. I mean, as much as it is about Julian and it is important to try to work to save his life, like that is absolutely true. This is literally the future of the First Amendment. This impacts every single human being. Like this is, um, it really is like a crossroads in human history. This is going to go one of two ways. We're either going to continue to have free speech and free press or we're not. It's that. That's what it is. It's that big. The next people are coming after the podcasters, you know, because anybody who's exchanging yeah. open ideas in a forum like this, you know, it, it's going to be eventually uh, we'll, we'll be going on for a long time before they squash us. I don't know. But, you know, it, it, that's the kind of thing that they just can't have. They can't have that free exchange of ideas. And, you know, the fact that Julian's wife is in jeopardy for basically putting out people it's like Orwell said, you know, um, 
publishing something people doesn't want, someone doesn't want to publish, that's journalism. Everything else mm -hmm. is PR. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And we are, we're already seeing, I think, the blowback from what's been happening to Julian in the censorship of our content, our respective content that we've been trying to put out. Um, so, yeah, if, if you don't see it now, then I don't know when, because it's never going to be more glaring than it is right now. Uh, yeah, so Magnus, you better go ahead and start Boogaloo Radio like immediately. Oh, we are we are we are in the works of both of uh, our own show, very much like this, and we kind of have, I don't know how to describe. We're gonna start a new movement, and like the Boogaloo's are going to be involved, obviously, but we're we're gonna create a new thing, and we're gonna kind of see what happens with it. Uh, I'm gonna we're still finalizing, so I don't want to give like too much away on it, but uh, we have we have plans. I want to do something with this. I don't just want to. Talking is great, and I, I feel like my existence alone has really, like, blown some fucking people's minds on across the entire political spectrum. But like, we don't. I don't want it to stop here. And the people, everything I say is off the backs of some giant people that have put in a lot of work in both our movement and the BLM groups that have worked with us and the Antifa groups that work us. And we we want to take this and snowball it even further into something much bigger. So. We're trying. We're just, you know, we're, we're going from zero to a hundred. We went from just a militia group into like, you know, this weird national movement into like now, like, well, fuck. <laughs> I just, you know, yeah. that's a, that's a, the only advice I would give you there is stay public. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're out there and you're public and you're out there, then you know, that's a safe place to be. Yeah, I, I mean, there is a little bit of like, it, 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 it's really hard to kill me if I'm on a podcast. There's definitely some some kind of like <laughs> thought about that. <laughs> Yeah, they'll still do it though. Don't you? Well, they don't say, think they won't. But no longer, kind of, than, no longer than two hours, they're going to want to kill you. Right. Yeah. That's that's like that's kind of you know one of one of the you know the core kind of things we all agreed in the Boogaloo movement is like we knew exactly what we were doing and we knew that like by getting together and talking about the things we were talking about and doing the things we were doing like it, it it's essentially just a a very complicated suicide cult of like we just all knew that like everyone who's involved does not expect to see the end of anything we're trying to accomplish yeah like, we, well, we step I'm, into it knowing very well that that is a, that is not only a possibility but it's probably likely yeah <laughs> or existen an existential cult would be a little more gentle right. but yeah i absolutely understand uh what you're saying and uh we're reaching we're, we've just reached the two hour mark so i don't want to keep um you and bruce too long but uh one more I thing. If there's I any to... like quick rapid things you wanted to like. Yeah, yeah. About. Just just one more thing I wanted to ask you about, and then um, I think Misty, if there's anything you want to ask uh, for the wrap up, that's cool. Okay. Uh, so Misty made me aware earlier uh, today. Um, I'm not sure when it came out, but the ADL, the Anti Defamation League, came out with a statement regarding the Boogaloo Boys. Not a statement. It's just on their website. It's like oh, they're. It's on... It's on oh, their they website. Up, they, did they update us? Because we were originally just classified as white supremacists, like back in June or so, some shit. So they've no, modified, they've modified not, that. No. To say you're Ooh. no longer white supremacist, but you are. Um, you Far are right. You are overrun with uh, right wing extremists, um, and they cite as one of their sources for this information, um, <laughs> Belling, Bellingcat. So well, that's 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 good though, because like. But Bellingcat and Reason Mag in RT, ironically enough, shout out to, to homie Putin, were like the three stories, and even Vice a bit, which was ironic. Like Vice even did, when they actually met on the ground and did documentaries about us, they were way more accurate and specific. Reason being a libertarian magazine, obviously the most positive. But even Vice News was kind of like, huh, there's, you know, there's an awful lot of black people here for a white supremacist movement. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like... Those people probably yeah. got it. Yeah, they probably no. Yeah, they probably the ADL, it. the ADL, very specifically said most boogalooers, which is a very fun word, by the way. I like uh, most boogalooers are like not white supremacists. <laughs> I like boogaloids a lot. I like that too. But the, okay, so most boogaloids <laughs> are not white supremacists, though one can find white supremacists within the movement. So most of you are not, but there are some, is what they're that's saying. A, that's which, that's at I mean, getting in line with like. Yeah, I don't. I still don't think that's accurate. But when you uh, JJ McNabb, which is the original extremist expert, she's a I think she's like a Washington State extremist expert. She works with the government and everything. She is directly cited by almost every single one of these articles all the time. 
and you can go on her Twitter page, and even she gets annoyed, gets annoyed all the time. She just tweets things like, no, for the millionth time, the Boogaloos are not a white supremacist movement. Because they'll they'll take like the worst parts of her, like backed by the government research on us, and pick those out, but then ignore the things about like, yes, we do side with BLM. You know, no, we're not white supremacists. They'll they'll ignore those parts of her research, and even the the experts themselves get ignored, get annoyed by the misrepresentation of who we are. So at least mm-hmm. they're in line with exactly what JJ McNabb says about us, which is the same thing. And she says like, no, they're not white supremacists, but there are some that try to get into the movement. Yeah, like, okay, well, that's it, that's fair. It's quite a, it's quite a long uh, document or statement, if you will, that's on their site, and I'll have to read um, it. If you read it, though, you'll see that what you were just mentioning about cherry picking and taking the worst parts, they slowly build up to that. And again, use Bellingcat uh, of all resources as uh, as one that they cite. So, um, again, that just goes back to that point I was trying to make about constructing a narrative about the movement before the movement is has even, for, for lack of a better word, coalesced. So... Um, I, I think that was, that's an interesting recent development to uh, to bring up, and it's almost like they're walking back a little bit, but they're they're still they're saying we we still don't really like these guys. Um, right? They don't want to they don't want to come it, across as liars. They're just it's a PR. Lie. It's a PR right. move. Yes. Yeah. So um, I actually just got a Twitter um, comment. Um, since we were tweeting at each other earlier and somebody said your friend is which uh, we're friends now magnus um hey, the easiest friend, friend i've ever is, made right <laughs> <laughs> so your friend is anti-communist and defended kyle rittenhouse his group debt is dedicated to starting a civil war and plotted to kidnap Gre- uh, governor whitmer get back to work the boogaloo boys that's in quotes so are you anti-communist uh, I, I originally like i even said on this show and i've said on other shows in june yeah, well, not specifically anti-communist, but specifically anti-Antifa. Did not like Antifa until, in living through the principles I preach now, I actually went on the ground and talked to some Antifa people. And then my mind changed. And that's why I advocate for what I advocate for. And it's funny, is they'll, they'll never do the same thing to, like, let's take even the most extreme example. Vice News will run, like, ex-far-right neo-Nazi reforms his ways and now speaks out against white supremacy. Obviously, we're not anywhere near that, but they'll run that all over the place. But dude who used to hate Antifa and now doesn't hate Antifa, unreasonable, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, a, 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 a ex-neo-Nazi can become a, you know, anti-racist activist, but a guy who didn't like a group of activists can't change his mind on them. And even the, the picture they share is so funny because uh, it's it was during the toilet paper shortage. It's like, if you're out of toilet paper, you can use these flags. And it was the thin blue lion flag, the Donald Trump flag, the con- flag of the Confederacy, the Third Reich flag, and then the Soviet Union flag, and then Antifa's flag. So they're using me as a picture of literally like, fuck everybody. You can wipe your ass with the flag of the Nazis and the Confederacy to prove that I'm a white supremacist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, keep, 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 it, keep, it, keep in mind that Vice also interviewed uh, Rich, Richard Spencer, uh, I think, on the steps of the Capitol. CNN. In some kind of fawning well, interview. Right. Richard Spencer is a, co- uh, is a contributor for CNN. Mm-hmm. Yeah. An yeah. official licensed contributor for CNN. An actual open Nazi that thinks that people that are one-fourth black don't deserve to be in the country. He can be on CNN, that? but Jimmy Dore can't talk to me. Was there any actual Magnus, any actual truth to the fact that some of the Boogaloos were involved in what happened with the governor up there? Yeah, or no? I, I, I explained that last night. So the Watchmen right. were a local, uh, they were a local kind of just gen, like generic conservative militia. It was run by a pastor or whatever. And we sh- were at lockdown events together. We talked, we knew them. And the particular point the FBI cites to try to tie us to it was one event where we had a joint training session, which happens all the time. And like even local police and stuff would do joint training sessions with the watchmen because that's what militias do. And off of that, of these six people that got arrested, two of them did identify as Boogaloo boys. But as far as I know, they weren't charged. They still haven't been charged. The four dudes that were actually going by the governor's house and planning to kidnap her and everything were just watchmen people. They didn't identify as Boogaloo. They never wore Hawaiian shirts. 
but they're just stapled to us because we happen to be in the same place at the same time. Mm-hmm. And they went after all of us because of that. I have a friend that all his only affiliation with the Watchmen and that whole situation was being at that training event together. That's the only time he had ever talked to them. He never had their personal phone number or anything. They raided his house like six months ago and took all of his laptops. They took all of his guns. They took all of his cell phones, which none of which he's gotten back. And then after like a week, we're like, oh, you're not charged with anything. And he's like, well, can I get all my stuff back? And they're like, no. So like, it is like this weird thing of like this guilty by association of like, they're a militia. We were a militia. We happened to be in the same place together. We talked to them. But this small group within the Watchmen, which was, it wasn't even all the Wolverine Watchmen. It was a small group within them had this really stupid plan that never would have worked and drove past the governor's house and were talking about it. And then two FBI agents that were embedded with them got them arrested, but that's somehow our fault. And we still had anything to do with that. And we've universally condemned it as a dumb idea. And that's not the way we'd want to go about it. And it, even if they pulled it off, it wouldn't fucking accomplish anything. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, yeah. That guilt, and that guilt by, that guilt by association is, is quite a bit like what happened to Randy Weaver and his family in 1992. Yeah. I oh, believe. You- was. You know, we we have we have. I'm sure I'm gonna, I'm sure I'm gonna get called a, a yeah. white separatist. Yes. That, but we get so much shit for having Vicky Weaver on our boog flag that has like all the names of everyone's been killed. We get so much shit for having Vicky Weaver on there, and it's like, so you support an unarmed woman holding a infant in her hand being shot in the head by an FBI sniper, which, mm-hmm. by the way, Bill Barr, our Attorney General, represented pro bono. A lot of people don't know that fact. I didn't that, know Bill, that Bill Barr was the attorney for the FBI sniper that shot Vicki Weaver in the head. You support that? You support a, a woman with a baby in her hand being shot in the head by an FBI sniper? Mm-hmm. Like, of course it's- I have her name on my fucking flag. I don't care if she was a Nazi. I don't care if she was a white separatist. Whatever. That is horrifying and does and, not. And, it's not right. And how? And how did that all start? Randy Weaver was tricked into selling illegally sawed-off shotguns by a federal agent who had infiltrated. Uh, a white supremacist group, uh, one of their meetings, um, and you can go look this up for yourself, anybody who's, who's watching. He was very scarcely involved with the group. He attended some meetings. He had some interest, and I believe it was because he needed to make some money that he decided to uh, try to sell these sawed-off shotguns. And that's what led to not only his wife getting sniper shot uh, in the head holding the baby, his son was shot in the back by a federal agent, his and dog then, was uh, killed. His yeah, dog a lot of was people killed. Forget that. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Harris. Well, they, they wouldn't the let family. him out. They wanted out, and they wouldn't let him out. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't let them out. They they essentially had to starve them out after they they slaughtered half the family. And yeah. if if they if they're gonna do that to Randy Weaver, why don't why do you think they won't do it to you? Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's a it's an infamous FBI thing of oh we stopped our own terror plot, mm-hmm. like the you know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and I and you know I don't know what's going to happen with the Watchmen. I haven't kept up with the case, but I compare it very similar to what happened in Arizona with the Viper militia. It's a story a lot of people aren't really familiar with, but uh, they they went after this militia and they arrested them and they say that they were planning to blow up all these gov- all these government buildings and kidnap the Arizona governor and that there were these crazy accelerationist militia. And then after it went to trial. Almost all of them walked or got a small fine, and I think the most one ever spent was a year in jail. And then it came out that, like, oh, the FBI said they had a bunch of explosives. They didn't have any explosives. They said they had hundreds of automatic weapons. It turned out they had a couple bolt-action rifles from World War One, And, like, it just slowly came that, like, every part of this story was a lie and just fabricated by the FBI to... Mm-hmm clickbait essentially like before the internet like like federal clickbait so, so so some agents could pat themselves on the back of like and uh infamously and the most important detail for that of that story for leftists to understand is the fbi agents were on record trying to get the militia to include white supremacist literature in their basic literature to try to get them to reach out to clan organizations and the viper militia were like no go fuck yourself <laughs> Yeah. But it was the undercover FBI agents that were trying to get them to associate with white supremacists. So, like, this is what feds do. Like, feds do fed shit. They're they're yeah. despicable people. Coin like, Pro still exists. It's just yeah. taken yes. a different form. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, what, a lot of the things when it comes to the Watchmen, I'm I wouldn't be surprised if all that was totally bullshit and pushed by the federal agent. When it comes to our two members that are currently on trial because they sold illegal suppressors to Hamas. 
the Palestinian terrorist organization. I'm like, really? Really? Not terrorists, though. I don't. I that's what I mean. no, that's what, that's what like that's what they're selling it as is like like Boogaloo right. white supremacists associate with Palestinian terrorist organizations selling yeah. illegal separate. It's like what? In in Minnesota of all places, it's like okay, so so you have Hamas members approaching two white dudes to try to buy like oil filter suppressors. Like, well, that's be so fishy. Cheap. That's fishy. Sounds, That's fishy. Sounds like a random circum, a random uh, uh, congress of events there. Right. Oh, like, so I, I don't believe it. So I wouldn't be surprised if half of the instances that are tied to us, like even Stephen Carrillo, who was the guy that ki- that ambushed the police officers in California, he was an Air Force sergeant mm-hmm. who most of us had never heard of before until he just materialized out of nowhere, shot a bunch of cops, and then painted Boog in blood on the front of his van. It's like. So, There's a lot well, of suspicious details of that story. <laughs> yeah. Never let them find out about your space lasers, because then you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I was well, so confused. I was so confused. I'm like, why is everyone tweeting about Jewish space lasers? I know. I was too. I was like, what is happening with these space lasers? What's going on? Yeah. Ugh. I was like, what the what a nightmare we live yeah, in, like, you guys. Like, to, to, like exactly like you said with Vicky Weaver and so many things like you have to be very suspicious whenever the FBI or the ATF is involved because they cause their own problems that they solve yes so often so yeah. often they'll, they'll, most of the time the I would venture to say most yeah. of the time they'll approach a protest group or a militia or a community defense organization put someone undercover in it and then have the undercover agent be like hey let's go shoot some cops hey aren't you guys sick of this we should be way more accelerationist let's fuck everything up and it's the FBI agent that's doing that yeah. Yes. Well, it's the same thing we do in foreign countries. We um, go and we create terrorist groups. We arm them. We fund them, and then we pretend we have to go to war with them because yeah. oil. Oil. <laughs> Syria. Right, yeah. Syria. Yeah. Libya. Yeah. yeah. So it, that's it, how it works. That's how this works. Absolutely. Any anything else, ladies and gents? No, I don't think so. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Yeah. I really do appreciate it. Thank, um, thank, Magnus, no, thank, thank you for having groups. me on. Yeah. 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 So. And um, yeah, Bruce, thank you for coming on too. Um, is yeah. there is, is there anything you guys like last word? Is there anything you guys want to tell everybody where they can find you on Twitter or whatever or do you, anything you want to say? Hydrated. Hydrate. Huh? Hydrate. 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 <laughs> Hydrate. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, I'm just, That's I'm good just, advice. Yeah, I'm just a uh, Ma- Magnus Panvidia, Magnus P A N V I D Y A on Twitter. That's the only place on the entire internet I'm allowed to be right now and it probably won't <laughs> last. And uh, okay. yeah, just uh, I'm going on Nico House tomorrow at eight o'clock, I think, and I uh, probably will announce the big project we have in the works on that show. So yeah, keep cool. posted. Yeah, and thanks guys for having me on, and uh, have a good night. Stay, stay yeah. safe, stay free. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you. all. Okay. Yeah. Thank you guys very much, and uh, we'll catch you guys next time. See ya. Bye.